So this is the overview of the 2023 Distress Halloween collection from Ranger. And you can see here that it's actually broken out by year. Uh, these were the sets that were released in 2021, same colors, 2022, same colors of 2022, and 2023. And when I say same colors, I don't mean as each other. I mean, we didn't change anything from the years. These are the new colors for 2023. Now, what Ranger did this year is actually brought back all the sets of mica stains we're going to get into mica stains if you if you want to know more about them there's actually two years worth of demos you can go back and check out you can check out the 2021 uh distress halloween the 2022 uh, we'll talk about the 2023 so if you if this is your first year your first season you're in luck because you can actually get all of the colors now if you've been waiting to stock up or maybe you missed out on a kit you can get that as well for the most part, retailers are selling them in these three packs because that's how Ranger is selling them. But I do know that there's some retailers that bring these in and open up the packages and sell the individual bottles. So check with your retailers on how they offer them. They might offer them both ways. Um, but typically this is how they are available. You'll see now for this year's packaging and not that last year's packaging is any older or anything, um, but we did put that color backing behind all of them. So you, you get a visual representation that the the colors, although we have, you know, essentially an, an orange, uh, a, a brown or gray and, and a yellow in each of the seasonal sets, as well as a green and kind of a grungy color and a purple, they're all going to be different tones. What didn't come back, and this is really important for you guys to understand, are crayons. Meaning the only thing that came out this year are the crayons, the, and these are mica crayons, so these are a pearlescent crayon. These distressed crayons only came out in the 2023 colors. So if you're looking to restock your crayons, that doesn't mean retailers don't have inventory. I, I looked just before we went live and there are retailers. I couldn't find any 2021 Halloween crayons anywhere, but I did see a few sites that had 2022 Halloween crayons left, but this is something that did not come back. And this is something, again, I don't know if Ranger is going to, to bring them back in the future, but this year they only brought out the, the new palette in the crayons, okay? So that's the overview for mica stains, crayons, and then we have paste. Um, Crip paste came back, much to my delight, and Tammy B and Zoe and probably many of the makers because Crip paste is rocking. We say Crip paste, I think Zoe named it Crip paste. It's really Grip paste, Crypt, but I think we just shortened it to Crypt paste. But also there's some new paste that hit, hit this, and if you've seen social, it's some cool stuff. We do have a glow, Grip paste glow, which is a glow in the dark paste. It is so cool, we'll show that uh, a little bit later. And then we have texture paste, black opaque. And the whole purpose of this demo is just to kind of show you uh, how you can incorporate these uh, different mediums and go through the pace and just hopefully answer as many questions as I possibly can. All right. So let me let me just kind of clear up the little problem. It's in such a great it's a great little cabinet door, but I got to I got to take this stuff off and hand it off to Mario. We actually get like a workspace. There you go, Mario. Thank hey, you. You're get my get my mat. Get this kind of set up, make sure we are set in place. All right, so I'm gonna have a, a little bit of a crap. I think for this one, uh, it, because it is gonna get messy, could you wear gloves, should you wear gloves? Probably if you don't like to get your hands inky because we are gonna be doing a lot of sprays, but it's gonna get, it's gonna get pretty inky. Um, but I'm just gonna move, remove this little craft mat because I'm, I'm going to put down the, the media surface mat, but not quite yet, because let's just talk about the colors and swatches and all that, and then we'll get uh, into the demo, okay? okay? So as I mentioned, the colors, I already have my sets um, open, okay? The other ones were packaged, so I'm just, I've got the sets for this year of the mica stains. It is nice that now we have a tin for the mica stains, so I would say uh, between both seasons, remember when the bottle, you have to just kind of pull this, you just have to lift this a little bit, it's not a big deal. Um, but there is a tin, so the, the Distress re uh tin, that's going to be this little guy, because this is it's the re paint tin, okay? Different than the spray tin. The spray tin's uh, bigger. I'll show you this, not to confuse you, because I know all the tins kind of look the same. This is the spray tin. So the spray tins actually fit the regulation size sprays. So if you're looking for storage for your mica stains, this would be the paint re one, but it does fit these mini stains. So these are my stains for the previous years. I've already swatched the colors. I've already uh, left some space open because I haven't put these in or the Christmas ones. So between uh, the seasons, it would be two tins. You can also put in 
any of just the mica sprays. These are everyday. Mica spray is different than mica stain. This is just the mica in a clear liquid. So it doesn't have any colorant. It doesn't have any stain in it. So, and there are different um, designer palettes of that, but those will fit in there and there's still space. Cause really all I need um, for the palette here, let's see, I've got three, six, nine. Oh yeah, I'll have one extra space left open after I put in Halloween and Christmas, okay? So the colors, I'm just gonna, gonna get set up. There we are, move everything out so I can kind of show you the swatches. I love to make swatches of the colors because it is important to always see how something is going to, to work out. Because you can look at a label, you can look online, but it's really not until you actually see it on a, a surface that you work on that you can appreciate it, okay? So a mica stain is a distress stain color, distress ink, mixed with a custom mica blend. What that means is that instead of just adding a, a green or a red or a white, the chemist, and so a shout out to Brian, who just absolutely rocked these, creates a custom blend of mica or pearl to coordinate with an ink color, whatever that happens to be in, in all of the previous ones and of course, uh, all of the new ones. So like even Ominous Twilight, it's a really deep purple. Now these colors are though, they're seasonal, so they have a unique name. They're, they are inspired by the Distress palette. So for example, Ominous Twilight was inspired by Villainous Potion. I want a really dark, uh, purple. So we kind of start with that ink base, we tweak the color a little bit and then create a pearl. And that that totally changes the dynamic of all of the colors. And some of them are really uh, cool. Phantom Mist, so good. It was inspired, uh, kind of a blend of weathered wood and ice spruce in this really unique kind of bluish silvery pearl. It's just absolutely fabulous. So the swatches, I create my swatches on Distress Watercolor cardstock as well as uh, craft heavy stock. Those are the two surfaces I use the most. If you work on black a lot, you may wanna spend the time to do swatches on black, whatever you do. I think sometimes people make swatches because they think they need to put it on every surface. Only put it on the surfaces that you're going to work on. So what this mica stain does, because it is a combination of ink and pearl, that pearl is actually fused into the ink. So when you shake it up, and you'll see when I demo it, the mica mixes with the colorant and it becomes one. So when you spray it on, it's already sealed onto the surface. You don't have to add a top coat. You don't have to do anything. It's fused in there and it will maintain that. You'll see in some of the techniques that as this mica stain drips off, it takes its pearl with it. So these are my other color swatches that I've done. I have them all labeled for all of the years. These are the new swatches. I, I had them in and then I took them out because I didn't want to confuse the issue. So I can just talk about the colors uh, for this year. So the new ones, this one is mulled cider. Now mulled cider is a really dark, and I have these to compare, a really dark orange, but not as dark as what we did last year. So this one, this is burning ember. This is the first one, jack-o'-lantern. So you can see this new color, it fits right in there. It is beautiful. So when you think, do we really need other colors? Well, it's totally up to you. I definitely thought when, when I was asked if I would be open to designing no new colors, then yes, absolutely. I needed it because I saw that there was that little skip, that little void. This one, this burning ember, this was definitely a, a darker color, kind of a rusty hinge meets crackling campfire. Uh, this one, mulled cider is kind of a ripe persimmon um, meets. It's got a little red hue to it as well, but I just, I love it. So you can see how that fits in. This next one, I would say this was actually surprisingly challenging. Uh, this is called Unraveled, and I wanted a color that was kind of antique linen-ish, but has a little bit of yellow like scattered straw, and that's where Unraveled came in. So when you look at the yellows, uh, but like these two, and Harvest Moon Flickering Candle, so you can see Harvest Moon was that really bright, almost kind of lemonade-ish. Uh, Flickering Candle, a favorite, that's almost fossilized amber. But you can see how Unraveled fits in. It's definitely muted, but it definitely has some some yellow hues, perfect for moons. Uh, that was the challenge that I was facing when I was doing Halloween, um, is that I didn't really want the moon to be, I mean, I know this is harvest moon, but man, it was yellow and I would always grunge it down. So I really love this color. And you can see that pearl has just such a, a great creamy hue to it. This one is fallen acorn. It's a, it's a dark, dark brown. Love the pearl in there. The browns that we had, we're actually really good. I mean, we had Cricket Broomstick. I did love Cricket Broomstick. We had Decayed. But you can see that this has kind of a, 
almost a, a reddish, kind of a light brown, but see, look at that dark brown. So we definitely needed that. I think there was space for that. And here's decayed. Let me pull that in just so you don't think I'm trying to pull a fast one. There you go. So that's kind of old paper-ish, I would say, decayed. Um, totally different than unraveled. So if you look at these two, I would say like antique linen, old paper almost. But you can see with fallen acorn, we've got a really nice dark brown, maybe a ground espresso uh, meets gathered twigs, meets walnut stain. I don't know. It's a good one. All right. Then we get into the next set. This is Phantom Mist. Ooh, like I said, it's a bluish grayish, silverish yum. Um, and I do love it a lot. And you might be thinking, well, hold on. We did Frosted Juniper, which you said was kind of a bluish. Yes, but you could see that has a, definitely some green undertones where this is definitely very ghostly, but also very different than the grays. See, that's why you do swatches because I think you need to kind of see them all because you're like, oh, it looks gray. Well, it does look gray until you put it next to gray and then you clearly see that it's blue, right? It has that, that blue hue to it. Oh, absolutely love it. So that one's Phantom Mist. This one, this one's an interesting one because this one photographs very weird. This is called Specimen. Probably one of my faves. Uh, wouldn't surprise you because it's a, a dark grungy color. But this one, we actually started with Forest Moss, which is a really, really dark green color in the world of distress. Uh, and I wanted this pearl to kind of uh, trigger a brown undertone when you see it. So, because otherwise it would just look green and I almost wanted it to look kind of scaly. I do love how this one turned out. So sometimes you'll see it in the photograph and you're like, oh, it looks brown. And then other times you think it looks green. But I think it just depends on whether you're seeing the color, the ink color, which definitely is a darker brownish green, or you're seeing that mica, that pearl. So here it is in the world of greens that we have so far in these seasonal mica stains. And you could see from the mica stains, and we would talk about seasonal just because that's how we launched them. But the reality is you have a palette you can use year round. But here's where that green fits in. It goes right after tree lot. So tree lot, that's gonna be, so they're all labeled on the back. I just printed these out. So tree lot, you can see is more of that piney green, right? But then we have like bubbling cauldron, we have fresh balsam. I mean, there's so many different shades of green, but not that dark moody one, right? And speaking of moody, we have Ominous Twilight. Uh, if you're a purple fan, man, this one is delish, but this one means business. Meaning once you get it on your hands, you're gonna enjoy that for a good 24 to 48 hours, uh, just because I wanted that intense purple. And you can already see uh, from these, so Hocus Pocus and Fortune Teller, one is gonna be more of a, say a violet purple, and then one is more of that reddish purple like seedless preserves. And here you can see, take a look at Ominous Twilight. And I, I called it that because you can see that it's a dark purple, but again, that pearl is just really beautiful. It's kind of iridescent -y blue. So it did give it that twilight vibe. And that's what's fascinating about these mica stains. When you use them on projects, whether you're using them on cards or whatever, um, you can totally have a, a different experience by how you incorporate them, whether you're stamping or, or spraying or saturating in the back. So those are going to be the colors and same rules apply in the crayons. These crayons, uh, let me just grab these real quick, pull this in. Like this is just showing the, the painted colors from the last two years. I haven't done a new swatch with new. I won't do a new swatch till after Christmas. So then I have a complete swatch. But I do love that when you see those seasonal colors, it's clearly a rainbow and we're building into that palette. So, you know, you can already predict that we're gonna have, you know, new pinks and reds in the Christmas sets and so on. But I just love how this palette is really shaped up. It definitely has distress vibe, but very unique to, to try to matchy match it to a distress, a distress color. So the crayons, the difference with the seasonal crayons and the regular distress crayons, these also have a mica or a pearl in them. And they, they cast a, a shimmery look, not as intense as what you would get in a mica stain, but definitely that shimmer. So you can see when the light hits it, that that color has a shimmer to it. And this is just a swatch on watercolor paper, on craft, and then on black. So on black, you really see uh, the mica versus the color, the shine. So you see it, it still has color. You can tell that that's an, that's an orange crayon, but you can really appreciate the mica in these. Now these are water reactive pigments, so you can watercolor with them, do all sorts of great things when it comes to, to working with these different products. So whether you like to color or uh, blend, whatever it is that you like to do, let's get this one in black. Look at those, woo wee, so good. Great, great colors. Now, same thing on the crayons. You can use them by themselves. Just color them and let them be. 
They will dry. You, uh, you can smudge them while they're wet, but they will dry. So it, it makes a great crayon that still has uh, that shine, that shimmer to it. Like I mentioned, you can watercolor. And even when you watercolor, you get a shine. Not as much, obviously, because you are pulling uh, that away. You're not making that intense amount of mica, but it still has that same sheen even after you watercolor it. Uh, and then of course, oops, upside down, uh, on, on craft, which pretty much is my favorite substrate for the mica crayons. I just love craft because I get the best of both worlds. I get, to me, it has way more shimmer than it does on white just because it's a darker background, uh, but it also has the color where on black, I feel that the color starts to get washed out and all I see is the mica. So you'll see me most of the time when I work with the crayons, I love them on craft. Uh, and this is uh, Distress Heavy Stock Craft, so it's a nice thick surface to work on. So those are going to be the colors. Now I can just take these out of the packages and get them. It's so fun. I always just wait because I just want them. I don't like to keep stuff in the packaging. I just want, I like to put it in general population. I think that's super important to me. They, it wants to join the party. So they're my other, those are the rest of my seasonals so they can pop in. They're like, oh, we want to join the party. All right, so I'll have those. Then we've got pastes. So let's talk about the paste. Oh my gosh, the paste. The paste are just good, okay? So this is Grit Paste Crypt, a favorite. We are three years with this one and I couldn't be happier. So thank you because I do love that. Um, I love the idea of having a paste that has a tint and has these little black flecks in there. And the interesting thing about this particular paste, let me, let me actually bring that in just to show you. Move these things away. I'm gonna hang up my swatches over here. Get this stuff out of the way just so I can, just so I have the ability to play. Okay, the cool thing about this paste is it's got that really interesting kind of a, a gray issue, but you can see when it dries, it definitely dries with kind of a green undertone. But what's interesting about this, all right? Uh, I saw a question about the crayons. Good question, Karen. So availability, availability of all of the distress seasonal, the mica stains and the paste have already shipped worldwide to retailers and they have been selling them, I think for the last week. The crayons, these will not be available until the end of September. There was a delay on that. Again, sorry, but the bright side is that when they come out, they will actually be releasing with the Christmas crayons. So mm -hmm. because they're delayed, we will actually be launching um, in at the beginning of September, we'll be launched or probably, yeah, I think at the beginning of September, we'll be launching the Distress uh, Seasonal for Christmas, which will be mica stains and, and new paste as well, spoiler alert. Um, but the crayons for Christmas won't be part of that release either. And then we're just gonna do all the crayons together at the end of September. So, I mean, Yes, do we have to wait? Yeah, we do have to wait. But the, the bright side is that at least they'll all be together and we don't have to wait twice. Things are worth waiting for. Well, we have enough stuff to play with. So that's just, that's how yeah, it is. But, once, so but it is good. Out. But like I said, if you can find the previous year's crayons, definitely get them because the only thing coming uh, in this year are this year's colors in the crayons. Okay, I agree, Julie. Plenty of time for Halloween and fall. And then of course, well, you, you now add them to your everyday palette, which is great. All right. So the thing about Crypt, and I've shared this in previous demos that, that you need to remember is when you have a paste, and the cool thing about this Grip Paste Crypt, it actually starts as a translucent paste. So we can kind of see through that. And the great thing about this is that uh, the thinner it is, we see more of that kind of greenish hue. The thicker it is, it gets a little dark. So this is the paste, just palette knife, let it dry. Uh, so you can go from thin to medium to really thick. And I love how those flecks just kind of uh, spread themselves out. However, because this paste is so wonderful and translucent based, you can color it. And this really opens up the possibility for year round use. And that's why I think watching demos are really important because often you'd see something released during a season like Halloween. It's named for Halloween, Crypt, and then that's it. You think I'm not a Halloween user or I'm gonna put it away until next Halloween. But I think you're selling yourself short. So here, this is taking an oxide reinker, so a distress oxide reinker you would use for your stamp pads, and tinting the paste. Now you can tint it with a lot of other things, and you're going to see that you can use ink, you can use oxide, you can use paint. I don't like to use paint because paint is 100% opaque. And if you mix paint with this, you're going to not only lose the translucency, but it will cover up these black flecks because you painted them essentially. So I only tint with inks when it comes to tinting my paste, whether that is an oxide or whether that is a distress ink. Okay, so keep that in mind. 
So antique linen, what I like about that is it turns this kind of uh, mucky crypt into a beautiful sand color. So if you're doing things that you want to create a beachy vibe or you want to put it through a stencil or you wanted to die cut it and add it, add a texture to die cut because it's, it remains flexible. Okay. So you can, it's a totally pliable medium. I love that antique linen gives it um, definitely more of a, of a beachy sand vibe. If you mix it with just regular ink. So here's the difference between the same color peeled paint, but this is a distress ink reinker. So not sprays, the reinker. If you do sprays in here, you're going to get it so wet, it will become very slimy. So this is just using um, reinker. This is going to give you a really deep green. So it's great for moss, but this gives you a beautiful spring green, right? Because oxide is a combination of dye and pigment. So that pigment is giving it just that little boost of color. But you can also notice that because it has pigment, you don't notice the flex as much as you do just dye. So there's no right or wrong. This is another favorite. Look at this. Crack pistachio. Oh man, that right there, Distress Ink. I, well, I like them both because it kind of gives me a mossy vibe. So great for moss effects. Fired brick, well, there you go, fired brick. Take a look at that. You mix this up, crit paste and this, and you go through a brick stencil. You've got beautiful bricks that you don't have to go back and ink because you've already inked the paste. So you can mix up a batch of both. Just put a little palette knife down. I normally just do one drop of ink. That's all it takes, mix it up. You can add as much as you want, depending on how much paste you need, but mix it up and then use it through your stencil simultaneously because you can combine kind of both color blends, which is great. Look at Rusty Hinge. <laughs> Rusty Hinge ink, and this is double the ink because you can make it as intense as you want, and this is oxide. So because ink is translucent, adding more than one drop will just make it a more intense version of that color. So many things, and again, swatches and notes because, well, my I mind. I love that you'd get, then you get the exact color you want. Yeah. You're trying to find, oh, this kind of works with that. Absolutely, and, and, and you don't have to remember when you have those notes, and I just keep them because Again, sometimes you look at a product and you're like, seasonal, I have no other use for it, bye-bye. But I use it for spring, for moss, I use it for summer, for sand, I love it for bricks, I love it for rust. So, so good. So that is Grip Paste Crip. Now, another thing, I'll bring this in really quick, because see, I've got so many ideas when I was prepping for this. Mario's like, what are you doing? I'm like, my ideas are, my ideas are popping, so I'm going for it. Okay, this is another thing that I shared, um, probably during Easter when we had the Salvage Rabbits, and uh, crit paste. This was inspired by Tammy B and how she utilizes because this is her favorite. I mean, if you haven't seen her on Instagram, she's like so happy it came back. But adding grit paste crypt to a lot of things totally alters the element. So for example, these urns, these were Halloween. These did not come back this year. Uh, they're not coming back, but they're very cool to make little, little garden statues. So you can paint them, you can add crayon, but see just a little bit of that crypt it just adds a great mossy element. This rabbit, and there's videos to, to talk about how this was done, but taking the salvage rabbit, adding it to this, that was Tammy's idea. I love just kind of creating this, this garden statue that looks like stone, but it's got all that mossy gunk because of grit paste crypt. And you can, in addition to using it, so you can use it as its color, which is what's done here. You can also go in with colors of distress crayon to add highlights. So that's what was done here, just adding, you know, little bits of cracked pistachio or rusty hinge just to give uh, some depth to it. So you can go in with crayons. The tombstones, so these were ideology tombstones that we had last year. These are thick, really great dimensional things. Look at how cool crit paste looks just going down the side of it. Not colored, just right out of the jar, just tap it on with your finger or a brush, let it dry, and you've got this great mossy tombstone. These did not come back this year. This is how they came back this year. Uh, totally different tombstones, thinner, because I figured if you had these uh, from previous years, now you can make a very cool uh, graveyard kind of cemetery. But we'll talk more about all that in the Ideology Live. But right now, just wanted to show how this paste really has some great uses and applications far out of just Halloween, okay? So let's move that out of the way. Little by little is how we do it, okay. So far, so good on the crypt. Next, we'll get into black. Black is very cool. Uh, the great thing about texture paste opaque black is that it's really just a, a color version of the regular opaque. So we'll talk about texture paste. So we have texture paste opaque, and that's just going to be white. We also have it in uh, texture paste translucent. But black opaque is just 
an opaque version that is black, which means it totally blocks out any of your background light. And this is one of the great things I can't wait to demo because it shows you some really cool effects, but I wanted to create a visual right up front because I know not everybody watches the whole demo, but this will give you an idea of what you can do with black and how it's different than just regular opaque, which is white. So here's kind of a little, I don't know, a little demo I did, a little comparison. So I took a stencil, I just used different cardstocks, right? White and black. So this is, this is black heavy stock and this is watercolor. So that's what I made my samples on. And the first thing I did is I took a stencil. It's one of my stencils with Stampers Anonymous. I love this one with all the words. And just placed it down and did the opaque white. Okay, so this one is opaque white on white cardstock. Then once it dried, I just went in with the new colors of mica stain and just sprayed across. I just masked it off with just, I hold a piece of chipboard and I just do it. But this way you can appreciate all the colors. The thing about both of these texture pastes, these are designed to absorb color. And people always ask like, well, how is this paste different than other paste? I can't really tell you because I don't use other paste, but what I, what I do know is that this paste is specifically designed to absorb water-based dyes. So whether that's dilution sprays or distress or any of those things, that to me is the important thing to note about working with mediums. That just because it says it's a paste, it may not have the same properties with other things. All right, so after this is dried and I sprayed it, you can see that the paste, the opaque, and this just has some press and seal over the top to keep it wet, uh, absorb the color just like the paper would. So that's why when you see it, the letters, same color as the background because the background paper is white, the paste is white. So then when we do the same paste on black cardstock, it's the same property as to understand. The black paper took the mica stain, but because this paste is white, now it looks kind of like neon, which is really cool. The words stand out even without the mica versus being part of the background. They're both very cool effects. It just depends whether you want your texture to be in the background or whether you want the stuff to just kind of pop a little bit more. Now, why, is, why are these different? Well, different papers, but again, white paste over black is going to make it contrast it's going to make it pop so knowing what we know about just that regular paste black gave us the total opposite meaning if i put black opaque paste on black paper it's going to absorb just like the paper does so now my black background doesn't look like it did with white see it absorbed the color it absorbed the color because it's black and black. It takes it exactly the same as the paper does, which is what, what's great. Just like the opposite, when you put black on white, oh, so cool. It also, because of the contrast, pops. It still absorbs that mica, and I love how it pulls up around the paste as well, but it absorbs that color. So you still get the shine, but you also get that contrast. Whereas if it's white on white, you don't get the contrast. See? So when you use it on the same, 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 white and black, it's the same. And then when you switch it up, you switch it up. So there's a lot of creative options now by having a black paste because it really does make that mica stain just pop. And on the backgrounds where we have some stencil stuff, it's just really cool. So that's just a great visual to understand uh, how you can utilize it. You could still use this with other things. You can still use uh, these pastes with, with crayons, with paints, with all sorts of things, but when it comes to the sprays, that to me is a, a distinct different and a reason why I wanted to have uh, a black and a white, because it just does something beautiful. different. Very cool. Well, I, I love it. everyone to take notes. So you <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, yeah. I, because I think seeing it is believing it. That's the whole thing. Sometimes you, you can just see it in a jar and you're like, yeah, okay, I don't, I don't get it. But then when you see that visually, you're like, click, I get it. And that to me is, is why I do what I do. That's, that's the whole point of doing a live, is so you understand it. Now we're going to get into, I'm just going to move this tin. It's kind of in my way for this second, just because I can't see any questions, because we're probably going to get a lot of questions on this next one, which is glow. Now, the thing about glow is it glows. It is a paste that is translucent based. So it is also a grit paste. So it's got this great texture. This is the color that it comes out. Just if you've ever seen any kind of glow in the dark stuff, like that's, that's the color. 
But there are properties about this pace that is very unique. And we're gonna get into some demos, but I also wanna talk about it at the very beginning. And uh, I don't know how this is all gonna play out. But Grip Paste Glow is a spreadable paste. So it's actually a little bit wetter than a traditional grit paste. Not a lot, but just a little bit. So it does allow you to smooth it out if you want. You can spread it out thin. You'll see why we wanna do that. But you can also still build texture. So the thing about water-based mediums, and we talked about briefly just press and seal, and I, I talk about this in, all the time. Because these are water-based, um, when you use the jar and you use your paste, and hopefully you do use your paste, uh, just because you put the lid on it, you're still leaving air in there. And that air sitting in the paste, even if you don't open that jar for two or three months, your paste is done. It's dry because all that's in there is air and it's drying out the paste. So press and seal is where I always... You know, when I use a jar, I put in some of that and I push it down to the surface of whatever, like however that goes. So that's why I have a bigger piece so it can just keep making its way down, always touching the surface, eliminating air, because that's what will keep your paste wet longer. You can revitalize your paste as long as they're not totally dried up with a little mist of water and you can stir it up. But once they go dry, they're done. You can't resurrect them, okay? Even a Halloween paste, you're not gonna resurrect them. It's just, it's done. But if you, if you maintain that and you have a couple of things, that's important to know. But on this paste, you may not like how fluid it is right out of the jar, so leave it open for a day. I did that um, just because I wanted to create some texture. It didn't matter when I mix it up, it kind of went back to a fluid nature. But uh, there's many things that you can do with this paste, including stencil and all sorts of things. But when I showed this to the makers, um, and Kuber was one of them that messaged me like right after. She's like, what, what about coloring? I'm like, I got you, I've already tried that. Um, can you color grit paste glow? Yes. Does it alter the glow color? Mm, not really, but kind of. And I've tried many, many different things. So I did a I could vouch for that. many things because I was like, well, I, okay, what about this? What about this? So my first thing was, what if I took grit paste glow and used distress embossing glaze? So uh, if you haven't seen this, you just put embossing glaze, which is translucent on the wet paste. You let it dry. Once everything's dry after about 30 minutes or so, you heat emboss it, so now it's shiny. But this is technically a see-through embossing powder. So would this glow pink? It does not. Does it glow kind of peachy color? A little bit. But what I found is that the darker I went, even though it's translucent, it totally impacted the glow, meaning it was not nearly as bright. So it kind of dimmed your light, okay? Certain colors, not surprised, but like this one, this is Squeeze Lemonade, it made it equally as bright. But that doesn't surprise me because yellow and green, I mean, that would be that bright color. This one, Twisted Citron, well, same thing. It, it made it kind of bright, but it's, it still started to, to dim the color. If you wanted to use it, you definitely could use it. You can use your embossing glaze, but I just didn't want you to think like, oh, if I use blue, it's going to change this to like a blue glow. It doesn't. Now, I've already said to the chemist, wouldn't it be cool if we can do grit paste glow in blue and pink and orange and those other things? Uh, so I'll never say never. I would love to see that come out in different colors. But right now, that's it. It doesn't mean you can't try it. Now, I've even tried it with inks where I was like, okay, let me just go in with reinker because, hey, I just showed that with uh, the grit paste crypt that you can just use distress ink. So I colored this with ink. Did it make it glow pink? No, it was better than glaze, I will say that. It, it gave me um, a little bit more glow. I will say that it maybe changed it a little peachy on this pink one. This went right to green. Uh, green, of course, went to green. This did not go to blue. And of course, when I got to purple, it was really too dark. And then I thought, well, what if I mixed, I think it was on this sample. What if I mix ink and glaze, blue and blue? Would like blue ink and blue glaze make it blue? No, it totally dimmed the light. I didn't see any glow through this at all. So my whole thing is if you want to play around with tinting it because maybe you want to have uh, pink stars and you want them to glow, yes, I would suggest using a distressed reinker. Probably not this dark color. This is picked raspberry. Maybe you want to use a sponge sugar or a light color and tint it and it will glow beautifully. So if you stick to light colors of ink, you can make this any color you want and it will still glow vivid. Just know when you get into these rich colors, it doesn't change it the way you think it would. And I tried, I really did. I'm like, I, I've got to get them a, a blue glow. But the reality is it just impacted the overall look of it. So if I'm gonna tint it, I would suggest tinting it with something a little lighter. 
The other thing to keep in mind is what you mix. I know that there's all the alchemists out there that go, ooh, but I'll take my archival reinkers or alcohol inks. You wanna be careful with that because this is water-based and if you add an alcohol ink to a water-based medium, it will change it. It'll turn this into chewing gum. It'll get slimy and snotty and it'll never dry. Uh, and same with, with archival, because I tried the same thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, food coloring. Well, food coloring, that's water-based, but the, the problem with food coloring is it's never gonna dry. So you might be able to tint it, but then every time you touch it, even on the dry paste, the food coloring will come off on your hands. So you might wanna just stick to kind of a reinker for stamp pads um, because those are designed to dry. But those are, again, you wanna try it. If you might find something, and if you do, hey, let me know. I'd be really curious as to what you, what you discover. Now, the thing about this stuff is that it glows indefinitely, meaning every time you charge it with just light, regular light, you could you can use a flashlight really close if you want, but just the, the light in a room will charge this to glow. So if you made a card with it, it would glow every time it was exposed to light and shut off. So when you get this in your, in your craft room, if you get it in your craft room, just keep in mind that, you know, when you turn the lights off, you'll have to get used to it the first time. It took me a while because I just saw like this beacon. I'm like, what is that? And then I remembered it was the paste. Um, but it, it does recharge indefinitely just with light, which is, which is really good. So um, we'll talk about this a little bit later. We will show you the glow effect. We have to shut off all the lights, but I don't wanna do that right now because I wanna get into demos, but we will get into that. And I have some ideas and some tips uh, on how you can maximize the grip paste glow, okay? So I did an overview, I talked about all the stuff. So now let's just get into, let's get into the play, shall we? So the, the thing about, Stains, if, if you have a mat that gets stained, you can use hand sanitizer. Uh, if you're pretty aggressive on it, it will start taking color, but that's what it's designed to do. It's just designed to be a working mat. It's not designed to be this pristine whiteboard. Okay, that's the whole idea. Um, yeah, I think it's Halloween, right? It just wants to like go away. Yeah. I think it's all because of the glow. Everyone I think wanted the room dark and think it was like the that, build up yeah. me coming in in a glow that, That's costume. what it was. Oh my gosh, that wouldn't surprise me. Okay, so when you work with mica stains, my advice to you is to lay them on their sides when you work with them. When I store them, I store them upright. I don't ever like to store a, a spray of any kind on its side over time because it could have a chance to leak out. But do you see when they're upright, all of your mica settles at the bottom. That's just what it does, it's, it's gravity. It just starts kind of doing that, all right? This one, by laying it on its side, this mica will start to shift and you can even see that it already started. It doesn't take long and it'll start laying along the long side of the bottle and that just makes it quicker to mix up. So when I go and use colors and normally I'll work like in a tray or I'll have a box and I just throw all of mine in on the side, okay? And then when I'm done, I put them away in the tin. So I don't just use it from the tin and put it back because my mica sits at the bottom and that just drives me crazy. But I don't store them on their sides because I just don't like to. Is there? Can you? You can certainly try, but I, I wouldn't want to risk. See, I might as well just take them all out, right? Who am I kidding? It's going to leave those in. Um, but if you hit, them, hit the floor, then that's just me. But I do have to get my favorite, Decade. Um, and I did get extra of Decade last year. I was very excited to see uh, some places have it. Okay, so we've got new, and then we have this other, this other stuff over here. Let's just work on this. So when we work with mica stains, what I'm going to do, and I like to, I like to share different ways that we can work with them. Yes, we can use them just all on, on its own, and I've got them kind of sitting around my media mat. Hopefully they don't roll everywhere. Um, but you can also use them with your spray stains, your oxide sprays, your ink pads, really anything. You don't have to just stick to mica stain. The one thing I would say though, is you wanna make sure that you use them uh, on porous surfaces. These are not meant for glass or plastic. These are meant for paper. You can also use them on wood. You can use them on fabric. They're not washable, but they will soak into fabric. Anything that will uh, be porous that will soak in. So you can definitely do that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll just do a, a few backgrounds and then we're going to get into the paste because I do have some stuff that is pre-pasted, but I just want you guys to kind of see how these react to start. And I'll do a piece of watercolor cardstock. I'll do a piece of craft. When you work on watercolor cardstock, you get to decide what surface. I'll even do a tag, why not? All right, that's, that is, this is mixed media, heavy stock. So that's a little cream, that's a little white, and that's craft. You can use the smooth side or the textured side of the Distress watercolor cardstock, whatever you like. Uh, textured side is going to hold onto the mica very different. So personally, I like the smoothie side because I get more of a, an all over look. 
this one you get like it, it likes to sit in these little pits but hey maybe maybe you're good with that so let's let's talk about just a background to start when i work with colors you can either ring the bell okay like that meaning when you try to mix the the pigments you can ring the bell or you can shake them up and down the thing to know is if you shake them up and down you could get some ink that leaks out of this nozzle a couple of drips so it just depends on how you how you want to work with it um, these aren't labeled these aren't indexed like my other ones i have my other one swatched so i know which which lids to match up later but hey if you don't swatch it then it's easy you don't have to even bother um, the other thing that you can do if you if you're going to mix them up is you can take a a cloth if you if you work with a cloth or a paper towel and then every time you shake it you can just cover the nozzle and shake it but i just kind of go for it to me when i get into like the spray zone i just like to go for it like i i'm just like i'm gonna embrace my messiness if you want to wear gloves that time go for it but just don't be don't be timid when it comes to working with spray mediums because i think you're you're taking away your joy you really are now when you're working with spray inks and I, you can go back and watch any of the spray lives because I talk a lot more about the properties of sprays and moving. I always like to start with just a little mist of water on my paper, not much, one spray. That just makes sure that the paper is not totally porous. You can see it gave it that arch really quick. This way, my inks flow a little different. They kind of flow on contact. Let me move this out of the way. Okay, so that's ominous twilight right there. Look at how saturated just that color is. So now if I go in with water, my ink is just going to start moving and I can get that color to move all the way out. I'll show you. Now, the reason it moved all the way out, I can keep going just to, just to show the visual and didn't create the stain was because I started with a mist of water. If you just take dry cardstock without water and you spray that, okay, that's the same thing. And each time you do want to give it a shake. I didn't shake this one, but each time I like to just give it a little, a little rattle. Then when you go in and start spraying this, it's very hard to get rid of that bullseye, even when you add water, because it wants to hold on to that shape because it's soaked into the paper dry. Do you see that? It doesn't mean they won't blend. They will blend, but that outline of the circle remains because it started on dry paper. Okay, so I'm still going to use this. It's not like it's not, not a game over thing. It's just something to note, okay? If you're working on a mat like this, just remember to edit, meaning if you don't want something, take it away. And just, I just use a little binky there. So we're gonna, gonna start adding some color. I'm gonna go with a little bit of specimen. We'll do some different palettes on this one. A little bit of specimen there. Easel, and you can see how quick I'll pick, uh, when I pick up the next one, I'll show you how quick that I did. I'm gonna do like, what are you gonna do like simultaneous, side by side on here. Okay, see that mica? See how quick it shifted up the side? That's what I think, you know, laying it on the side. It's not like, oh, I need to do it and, you know, go make lunch. You're, you're ready to go. It just takes minutes. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, some people think like, oh, I need to do it overnight and, and plan before I, I use them. But you, and you really don't. You just can. All right. A little bit more ominous there. Okay. So here's what we've got so far. Just some sprays. I'm going to just mix these up. We're going to do some layering too. I'm just going to use a little bit of water because we're going to utilize what's what's on the mat as well. Because I have a foundation of color, I'm just going to dry, okay? And I'm using a heat tool to dry versus an embossing gun. I prefer a heat tool just because it doesn't blow everything everywhere. I can be less than an inch away from the paper. I don't have to do this. I can, so you'll see that the paper curls up. You see that curl, but just stay there. It's like a magic trick. Once the moisture starts to leave the paper, then the paper will just start to flatten back out. Another thing that you can do if you have a laminating machine, you can, or a mink, you can put it, put it through there. Uh, when your backgrounds are done, it's an easy way to dry it. So you can see my backgrounds flattening out. I'll go over here, take a look at what's going on there. Whoa, beautiful. Okay. So these don't have to be crunchy dry. These just, they just need to be not fluid at this point because I'm going to layer. So that's good enough. Okay. So what do we have here? Well, we've got, mica stain that we can use if you use it as a spray it's going to probably stay as a spray so i want to just add a little bit of water just to kind of break this up so i'll just use my fingers just to break that color up then i can take my paper it has no memory so just because it wants to sit like this just bend it the other way and now we can just 
play around, just kind of tap around. Now you will create some sludge depending on where you're at, but what we're going to do is start building up the background, be that drips, be that layers. And so that's what I'm saying. Like if you just go for it, just don't worry, just enjoy the process. As I say, every time we do ink, wet on wet blends, wet on dry layers, which means if you kept putting that piece of paper into this ink while it was still wet, all that color will blend together and you will end up with just mud and maybe mud is your goal. But if you dry it, even if it's not crunchy dry, just dry, you're able to layer and you'll see that these drips, let me just get these dry up here, they actually sit on the surface. And that's what I love about working uh, with different, different inks and mediums. So see how those just kind of create their own unique outline. And every time you do, it creates a new effect. And the mica stays with its color. This is what I was trying to tell you. So you can see in Ominous Twilight, that purple, it stayed with wherever that purple ink went, it took that mica with it. And that's what makes it very different than sometimes you make your own pearls. You may have seen on YouTube of like, oh, just take a pearl and add water. Yes, you can definitely do that, but it doesn't have the same properties as this product, meaning it won't, it won't hold on to the pearl with the color. It will just start separating the more water you add. But again, you need to do what, what you like and what works. Here, I'm just gonna take this. I'm just gonna add a couple more drips. There we go. This little side here, I don't mind embracing the space, but you can always go in and add some water and it will react. So we can fill in those areas at any time. And water, if I just squeeze the trigger slow, I get drips versus mist, okay? So let's dry this as well. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So do I always dry after a layer? Well, you don't have to. You can let it air dry, and quite honestly, the longer it air dries, the more it's going to uh, start blending and reacting. But if you like the outlines of things, like if you like to see the, the distinct shape of a drip, then drying it actually creates an outline. And that's what I always like to do. But again, that's, that's me. So by adding the water this time, now I'll just take a, a paper towel. I'm gonna lift off that water area because I wanna reveal these white spots. So see, water will also lift this color. It doesn't, I mean, it takes it all all right out. If you didn't use a paper towel, if you use, say, the, the cotton towel instead, it wouldn't pull it out. It would just kind of dry it off. So it really depends on what you want. But I'm loving this background. Like, look at all the mica color. Very cool. Okay, let's move this to the side. I feel at this point I've got sludge. So I'm just going to get rid of that because there is there's a lot of there's a lot of orange, a lot of orange, a lot of purple and some specimen in there. So that's pretty much just going to be brown on brown on brown. I don't, I don't necessarily want to do that. Let's work on this background. This time, let's bring in a couple of other characters, right? Let's take in something else. Let's, let's bring in some other kind of sprays just so you can see. Um, maybe we want to use an oxide, we'll use an oxide spray. Maybe we'll even add uh, a color. So we'll use spray stain. We we'll use Uncharted Mariner. That's going to add some really, really rich blue to it. Okay. If I spray it directly on it, it's, it's going to overtake everything. So I'll still take my spray and I'm just going to create like a little splatter. You kind of saw a little, little drizzly bit adding some water to it. Do you have to add water? No. Do you have to go in with your fingers? No, but that certainly breaks up the party and allows me just to manipulate this color in different areas of my background versus if I just stuck it in that blue, all of this would just become Uncharted Mariner. So. Those are just little tips. It doesn't mean you have to do it that way. Never, never. There we go. Mm -mm. That Uncharted Mariner, that color is just really something else. Beautiful, beautiful. And this is just showing that you, if you didn't have a spray and you had an ink pad, you would just smush your ink pad down, spray it with water, run your fingers through it again, just to kind of break it up. I think that is important. And then we're just going to keep adding some drips in here. Okay, so this is what I really like about having just a, a bigger mat for wet techniques. I don't always bring out the mat. I, I probably would say that I work 90% just on the glass mat with that little side piece because that's enough. But in cases like this where I really want to do a lot of mixed media nonsense, um, I just love having this larger area. So I've, oh, this one's salvage patina. I thought I grabbed cracked statue. I'm going to take salvage patina. I'll be good with that. So this one's an oxide, so it does need to be sprayed. It does need to be shaken up before you spray it. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna just spray some down there. 
all right? I'll add a little bit of water to oxidize and I'll break it up. And you could break it up with a paintbrush or something else if you don't want to use your fingers, but that's going to be the best. Look how it's, look what we got so far. Okay, now I'm just going to add a little bit of this. So what the oxide is going to do is it's going to, it's going to introduce a whole different vibe to this because an oxide is a fusion of dye and ink. So this will be that oxidation. It's going to add that creamy, dreamy effect to the top of it. So, so good. Beautiful. I see a question. Will you be showing makes from your team? Uh, not for this one, but yes, makes all month. So there are makes for Sizzix and makes for stampers and makes for fabric and makes for ideology. But we don't really make for Ranger because Ranger product is used in all the other brand makes. Ranger is usually more about understanding the product in the demo. So yes, there will be makes uh, the rest of, of the month for live. It's going to be great. I can't wait to see what they did. So take a look at what happened. You see that kind of creaminess that went over it? Isn't that beautiful? It's a great thing, but now we're still getting the shimmer. We're still getting the shine of the mica stain, but notice that it just stuck to wherever that color is. And if you want to add more, you can. We can take a little bit. I'm just going to wipe this up, clean this off because I want to add a little bit more mica stain. This time I'm going to go in with some phantom mist. Now you can mist it on. You can also just take this off and you can drip right from the schnozzle. So if you want to create some splatters like that, you can easily do that, or you can put it on, you can flick it on, you can use a brush. This is going to create uh, some big, some big drips. I'm also going to add just a little bit of water just to, just to move those and we'll dry these. Beautiful. All right. So Phantom Mist is really interesting because I do love the, the look of it. I think that by having that little bit of, of shine, it just, I don't know. Well, it's misty. It's phantomy. It's Phantom Mist. All right, I'm gonna add a little bit down here. You see that little spot? I'm just gonna go in with just a, a little bit of that. Not too much, just a little splatter. And I think I'm also gonna do I also want to do, where is it? There we go. I'm going to do a little ominous. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned right here just because there we go. That's good. Okay. Yes. These sprays would look great on light colored wood, but keep in mind that it's not something that you can seal because if you apply a sealer, they're going to rewet. You could use a spray fixative. Um, but I found that any sealer that I've applied over the mica actually changes it. But yes, you can put it on wood. You can put it on even dark wood or light wood the same way. Anything porous, you're going to be good. All right. See, look at that little bit of ominous there. And I'm going to utilize this. Why not? Let's see what we get. These are going to be kind of tiny little drips. If I want more, I can just spray some water in there, break it up. Because this is going to be reactive. So you don't, the whole point of this demo is just to remind you that you don't have to do it one way. I think so many, Mario, we don't talk about sealing. Um, so many times, like I, I think that when people talk about, you know, videos or maybe we see tutorials, it's like, this is how you have to do it. And I, I never want anyone to think that maybe this is the way that they do it to achieve that effect. I totally support that. Right. So if you are trying to mimic an effect that maybe you've seen someone do, that is the steps that they took to do it. But, there's not like a set system, meaning, oh, is oxide always the final layer? No, you can add some mica. Can you drip it on? Yes. Can you spray it on? Yes. Can you blend it with inks? Yes. And you can, you get the idea that you can just keep playing and incorporating so many different effects with, with these products. And I absolutely love that. Just going to spray with a little water. We'll clean that. If, if it was just me, I'd probably have a stack of paper and just keep going in. You can see these little stains here that happen. It just, it is, this is a, a workspace and I hope you guys treat it as such. Okay. Let's get into that craft one. This one, uh, same thing. I'm just going to do a, a little bit of water. This one, I want to take a little bit of specimen. So you can see because it's green, it goes on, looks brown. I'm also going to take a little bit of unraveled. That's going to add that kind of golden color. We're going to go to some older colors. This is Wicked Elixir. This one's really, really good. I want to hear that mixing ball in there because otherwise it just means it's, it's stuck in the sandbox. And you want to make sure that that just goes. There you go. You hear it now? Yeah. So don't think, I mean, it does happen occasionally that might miss a, a mixing ball, but for the most part, 
If you're not hearing that rattle, it means that there's still a consolidation of pearl. And what could happen is um, if you don't have it mixed and you go to spray it, it could clog the sprayer. There are some tricks to, to unclog them. You can soak them in hot water. You can spray them, you know, spray it upside down in the water. You know, worst case, you can get replacement sprayers from Ranger. They sell them in a two pack and you just, I always have some replacement sprayers because I would rather get to, to creating and then I'll try to, to fix or unclog it a little bit later. So, all right, we're just gonna add some water to this to, to blend that color out a little bit. And I'm gonna do a little bit more of that brighter. Oh, look at that, see? A little splattery over the top. Now let's dry it and see what happens. The thing that you're gonna know if you've not played much with the mica stains, you kind of don't know what's going to happen until it dries because you can't see any of the mica while it's wet. You just don't. All we see at this point is just, it's just ink, but it's when it dries that you get that cool effect. So I'm going to just move my paper. You see those little drips? I'm going to get those to kind of, oh, specimen is crazy good. Yeah, I, I have replacement sprayers at the ready because m myself and resist spray, we don't seem to get along very well. Um, I think it's just because I, I don't, clean it as quick as I should. I kind of want to finish the creative process before I clean, so that's on me. But yeah, um, that one, like the, for the resist spray, I literally take it out, spray it under hot water, flush it complete, and then put it back in after every time. I don't just wipe it. Like that's a full on, that's a full on cleanse on that one. Okay, look at this. <laughs> look at this for the grunge. So this is what is so magic about specimen. There's no brown used right? But that green is a very deep, deep green. But look at how that looks. That highlight right there, that's unraveled. So that's that color that's kind of scattered straw antique linen. And this, this vibrant green, that's wicked elixir. That's kind of twisted citron-ish. But now you can see the background of this and just how amazingly fabulous this really is. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same background on white because although I showed the swatches, I think sometimes seeing it demoed will have you connect the dots even more. Okay. Can you clean this? Yes. Are you just going to spray it again? Yes. So it just goes right in the sludge. I, I don't have a problem with keeping the backs of anything clean or whatever. So let's try to mimic what I did where I started with some specimen. Then I went in with some Unraveled. And then I went in with some Wicked Elixir. And then I even think I dribbled it on. I think I maybe added a little bit of water. I'm hoping. Eh, pretty close. All right. And we're going to dry it. Okay. And again, if you want things to blend. So see right here, that little dark line? You get what you get. And you don't throw a fit. But you can still edit as you go. Some, you know, it's not going to... It's not going to surprise you from a movement perspective as it dries. So if it, if it looks like a line, it dries like a line. So you may want to, you know, at least just go in and kind of knock that, knock that out a little bit. If that's, oh gosh, this is so good. I get distracted. I totally lost what I was saying. Anyway, my point is whatever you see, the only thing that's going to be different when it dries is seeing the mica, but it's not going to actually change the ink movement. So all of those things can happen before you go in and dry this up. This is looking good. And we will use this, this stuff around the outside. Okay. So for this one, I'm just going to go along the edge, just kind of blot that. Yeah. Look at that little, that little drippage is good. I still have all of this. So let's do both backgrounds in there here. I'm going to spray it with some water because you can see how that color comes to life. And I'm sure the camera really picked it up. When water hit it, you really saw that like radius of that bright green because these are water reactive. So water makes that color really, really come to life. But I just want to move that around again, just because that's going to create different size drips and lines of ink. And that's going to allow me to just splash in the puddle a little different. So we'll do that on both of these. And again, paper doesn't have a memory. So if it, you don't want to try to put it in like this, because what are you going to want to do? You're going to want to push it. And if you push it, you've now just done a handprint. So just get your paper the way you want it to be. And then like I was like swat the fly, like take it and actually try to tap it in there. See, that's, what's going to give you these little designs, swatting the fly, not actually pressing the paper. We want it just to pick up all those little, those little drops and drips. Okay. Good enough. Take this. Yep. 
I know. People with journals or backgrounds be like, I would want to use it. I, I hear you. I would want to use it too. But for the sake of the demo, we're doing it. So you can see that drippy pattern that we use just from uh, the, the overspray. And that's really also why if you're like, hey, I normally see you use a splat box when you spray. Yes, absolutely. But not if you want to use up the stuff. Unless you put a mat in your splat box, then you could, you could do that too. So, yeah, there we go. Nice. And it's just about remembering the things. You know, I, I find myself like, I just like to experiment. And you can see with the, the glow. I mean, Mario came in, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, really nothing. Well, what's it supposed to be? I'm like, well, what it's supposed to be is obviously not what it is. But that doesn't mean I don't want to try. And I think, you know, I also do believe as a, as a product designer, as much as I try to encourage everyone to try it themselves, I don't want you to waste time on doing things that I feel are not going to work. So if I can test out the idea first, doesn't mean you can't, but it hopefully will save you some time and some money that, okay, well, I really thought that was going to be a good idea, but maybe you have a workaround. Maybe you do. Okay. So I'm not going to dry these all the way. You see that? You see that I've got still some, uh, some wet areas where I added some more water. This is where taking something porous, again, paper towel, is just going to create a lighter effect of those wet areas still. If I dried them, they would dry the same as my background. Okay, so let's look at these. Let's look at them side by side. Okay, craft white. The only difference really is the color, the ink, is more visible on a white surface. That's to be expected because of the dyes. So here I would say that this looks more dark green then here looks more dark brown, but that's to be expected because it's on brown. Uh, this is definitely more of a, of a glowing green, that citron, than it is here. But it's still visible and it's still, it's still right. And the mica just is electric on both of them. So, so important. Okay, so what could we do with these? Well, let's, let's play around with this background first before we, we move on because this, I think, is going to inspire uh, a folder. I'm just going to use a little bit of water. I like to... I like to stay somewhat clean. Again, all these little marks. I could go in with sanitizer if, I, if it really bothered me, but I just kind of leave it. We're going to create something kind of, something kind of fun and creepy. We're going to mimic some stains. So let's, let's bring this in. That's the other thing about uh, doing a, a Ranger demo is I love that you can incorporate so many different products in with, with inks and paints. So I shared this in a photo yesterday. Take a look at this one. Ooh wee. Um, this is a new reptile folder, perfect for this kind of background with specimen. Um, done a little different. I think this one's a little darker than this, but hey, I think it's going to work. It's going to be great. I'll, I'll do a little bit of that light splatter. You see that little splatter? I think that's some cracked pistachio, but we can mimic that. But that's another thing. If you have embossing folders, all of these inks and sprays really transform these folders, whether you're using uh, paints or, or glazes or inks, it just takes regular paper and transforms them and people say like well do you emb emboss first do you color like what do you do it just depends it depends on my mood most of the time i'll work on backgrounds and then i will emboss them but sometimes i can work from an embossed background just because i'm in that mood of not doing anything but embossing paper okay so let's let's kind of transform i do love this one it's from last year that's just craft stock that's just paper crazy okay Let's find that one. There it is. Cool little reptile. Get rid of those dyes for now. Okay. I think I'll use this lighter one. So I do want to create some of those little mossy effects. I found that to be very interesting. So we'll take, I know I have cracked pistachio in here. That one's going to be greener than uh, salvage patina. It's an oxide spray. We're just going to add that on our, on our background. Okay. Okay. There we go. Again, a little bit of that. I'll just spray it here. I don't need much of this because I, again, I just want to create some, some drips, a little water. Another thing to keep in mind, and you know, we joke about it a lot and this isn't to make fun of anyone that it matters to, but this is really about the whole sealing thing. Um, you know, it's not necessary to seal all of your products. Most of the water-based things are just not meant to be sealed. Um, you could do a, I mean, you could do a workable fixative. There are different sealers out there, but people that get concerned about creating a card or a background or a tag and worrying about sealing it, you know, if it gets wet, 
the ink might be fine if you seal it, but your paper is still going to be lasagna, your ribbon, like all of the other things on it are going to be destroyed anyway. Um, but if you're, if you're sealing it, yeah, exactly, Zoe, don't lick your art. Um, I just want to say, like, if you're sealing it because you're worried about the recipient touching it and it coming off, it doesn't do that. Um, well, at least any of these products don't do that. Once, once a product is dry, it's, it's meant to dry on its surface. So it's not like... Oh, but if I, you know, I have a friend that lives in Florida and if they, it's, you know, it's humid there. So when they open it, is the card going to be seeping through the envelope? No, it really, it shouldn't do that. So, okay. Nice, nice, nice. I just saw, will I show the tapestry? Yeah, we're going to, I'll actually, uh, I'll be demoing probably later in the season as well. But yeah, that tapestry folder is cool. I did see someone ask about the skull. The skull was last year. I think it's been retired. Uh, but if you can find it, get it. You can see it's definitely a favorite. Uh, tapestry. Yeah, that's just an oxide pad over the folder on black cardstock. So Haunted Mansion vibes. Anyway, all right. So back to this. So we added that oxide. So see what that oxide did? Whoop. See, I just created those little, oh, it's just so, so good. All right, let's, let's emboss this now, okay? So when we emboss it, I'm going to take, you can use whatever machine you want. I'm using a camera-friendly machine, one that I can just fit on frame, but I've got... I've got the Switch Plus, I've got the Vagabond, I got the whole deal. This is just why I'm using this one. And I, I actually will say I prefer a motorized machine um, for embossing. It's just easier because these, these 3D folders, they're, they're a beast to get through a machine sometimes. They really are because they're thick. But what we have is our background. And for the most part, our background is dry. Typically, when you do a folder, you want your paper to be somewhat wet. You spray it. And I will spray it, but I'm not going to spray my inked side because I don't want these colors to bleed. I, I don't care if they bleed a little bit. I'm just going to spray it on the back side just to make sure that my paper isn't totally dry. So just I'll just kind of hold it off camera a little bit. Um, just a couple of sprays on the back is enough when it comes to see when your paper starts to curl, you know, it's enough. OK, let's open up the folder and <laughs> my folder's wet now. I did that last time and then your machine doesn't grab it because it wants to slide. Okay, so we've got a printed side. That's always going to be the top. That's going to be the, the texture part. We're going to place this down. Okay, now when I go to emboss this, it would just emboss the normal design. Let me, I'm going to try to move this out. Sorry, guys. I just want you to see what I'm talking about. I'll bring that machine back in. So if you were to close your folder and emboss as you normally would, it would emboss. It would emboss the paper just like it embosses here. But the difference between this one You'd think I would just be more together. And this one, and why this stands out, is because you can see these lines, these black lines. Some people work backwards. Some people start on black cardstock and then layer color over the top. If you do that, you're pretty much limited to paint. And that's, that's not a problem, but paint is, you know, just something that you really have to know. I like the fluidity of inks and mica stains, so I often work on white cardstock and then add the black later. So how I'm going to add the black to this folder is using archival ink. Now you can try whatever you want. Honestly, uh, this has been the best. Okay. Stays on, dries too quick. Pigment never dries. Distress ink or oxide doesn't really like to uh, stay uh, on the folder enough to transfer. This is an oil-based permanent ink. This is the distress archival stack. So it comes in the regulation size. Uh, this, these are just distressed colors, but you can use any archival ink because it's oil based. Um, this is just going to be the blackest of black. So that's black soot, distress archival. All the other archivals come in minis, but this is sold in a four stack. And I do love it because these are the colors I would use not only for stamping, but for this technique. Like for the wood grain, I used hickory smoke when I did, because I did the same exact effect on this one, white cardstock, but I put the color in using hickory smoke. So I do love different colors of archival. So what I'm going to do is on the side that's going to be pressing in. So the, the side that has the lines, this one's a little hard to tell, but it's got the lines. That's where I'm going to put my ink. So I'll just take my ink pad and I'm just going to swipe it. Okay. I don't want to press it down because I don't want to get ink into uh, the debossed areas. I want it just to stay on the high points. So by dragging that across, you can see the colors there. You have to work fairly quick. I would say within, I'm going to just miss the back of this again. Um, I would say within minutes, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe seconds, maybe that's better. So now I'm just going to close the folder right onto that 
place it onto the platform. One cutting pad. Thanks, Mario. Get my machine back in and off we go. So I'm just going to put that. I'm just going to engage that. And I'm normally I have a, there we go. Mario's going to use it. I don't normally work on a mat that's slippery. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So once it's engaged, we're just going to run it through. And once I kind of feel it like release, which is kind of, that's what it's doing right now. It's kind of a pop. I'm just going to go back the other way. So I like to do a couple of passes um, on a fold away. Sometimes you get away with one pass. That's totally fine. But this is what just happened. So it debossed those black lines to make that visible. Now, do you have to ink it? No, but that's really how those ink lines show up. Could you ink it again and do it again? Sure, let's do that just to show you if you can do that. The thing to remember is the more you do it, uh, the more your paper just starts to kind of take a beating, but it's not too bad. Let me just, can you hand it? Just for a second, I'll need it back, thanks. So let's just say I want more color here. Okay, in these areas. Well, that's fine. I don't, I don't necessarily have to do the whole entire thing. I could just say, okay, well, I want some more here and I want some down here. So I'll just really make sure I get some more ink there. All right, perfect. I place it in the folder and you'll feel it like lock. So see, this wasn't set right in the middle, but it locks right into that texture. So as long as you're kind of in the same spot, then you can just close that. Thank you, Mario. You're welcome. Put that in again. Place that. Normally, try to keep your folder at an angle as well. If you have it straight on, it's very hard for the rollers to grab. Um, I, I don't really know, I would say, the, the proper way. I tend to go fold in. Um, I think that's the best. And I guess my, my reasoning is, is like, if, if everything has to line up and it grabs here, it's like pushing everything down. And this still has the ability to open and like exhale. Whereas if you put the open in first and it's wrong, it's going to kind of ripple and it's going to want to like pop the seam. Not that that's ever happened, but that's just how my brain imagines an embossing folder to be. Don't know if it's right or wrong, but that's what it is. So what do you clean this with? You would clean the archival ink with any stamp cleaner. So whatever you clean archival, it could, it could be rubbing alcohol, it could be hand sanitizer, or it could be archival cleaner. I use archival cleaner and then I rinse it in water, but that's how you take the ink out. It's very, very easy to do. All right, let me set that over there. Probably get back to that another time. And here's what we've got. We've got this really cool, I love that this folder has these really uh, solid areas, but take a look at that scaly vibe with that mica shine to it. Isn't that great? Amazing, so, so good. Um, if, you, if you didn't want to use mica, you could do other different things. Um, you could put resist spray on it. I've done that before. This is gonna give everything a shine. So you could put resist spray. It will take away the mica, and it will give it more of a gloss, but that's another option if you don't have mica stains to do it, but pretty cool. Um, I think that that's really uh, a great way to alter a background. Now, the difference between these two, obviously more specimen, less specimen, because again, specimen's a dark color, but I don't mind this. I love it because I could cut this and tear this and just use it for, I can cut something else out of it, but how wild that that is a piece of paper, crazy. Crazy, crazy. Um, yeah, same idea here. Just mica stains, a little phantom mist, all that. Now this folder, you have to be careful because this is actually a plank crackle. Meaning if you look here, there's these great vertical lines because this is scanned in from a, a plank. And these planks like to come apart. See that little line in the back? There's two of them actually, not just one, there's two. Um, but it is nice. I mean, you can keep it together, but it's also a nice clean break that if you wanted to just take it, you've got some cool uh, border strips, which I don't mind. You could just run that through your trimmer and now you have little plank pieces. Anyway, just a lot of fun to work with uh, embossing folders, especially when you're, when you're utilizing this. So let's just talk about some other, other backgrounds that we can create. This cool thing is working with paste and paste change everything. And you can use paste on many things. You can use them on just uh, plain, right? You can also use them uh, on printed paper. So this is ideology backdrops. And these of course are the distress uh, heavy stock tags. This is black paste. And this is Crypt. Both will take ink just a little differently. But I want you to know that you don't always have to be uh, stuck to, to plain cardstock. You can totally alter your, your background. So this is all from Halloween. So let's say we just wanted to, I don't know, create some cool effects. Let's take this one to start. Um, maybe we wanna go in and I'll do a little bit of mold cider. So on this paper, do I wet it? You could. 
Uh, it just depends on what your plans are, honestly. On this one, I just like to kind of just add some sprays. Let's take another color. I'm gonna take a little, take just a little winterberry. This is a little bit of pink. So that's gonna be good. Add a little bit of that. Where is that brighter? There you are. Little fortune teller. Okay, that's gonna be beautiful. That's gonna give me some purple. And then we want to take, hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm looking for, oh, that'll work. Oh, that, uh, I don't think I want that. I'll take with this. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know what I want at this point. I'm just going to take a little bit of green, but I don't want it to mix and create brown. So here I've just misted it. This one's no water. You could use water. You could do all that. But here I'm just going to, um, Tiffany asks, is a plank folder? Yes, that's actually the new one. I think that's Crackle. So that's, this one is a new, this is a new folder. So uh, this is this year, Tapestry this year, and Reptile. So this is all this year's release with Sizzix. So and, uh, very, very cool. Um, oh, Simon, Simon Says Stamp has that skull. That was last year. That's such a good one. All right. So here I'm drawing this. But what I love about working with product on different things, okay, it just gives the ability to alter your papers because you wouldn't think like a printed paper, but why not? Because this now we we have that little texture, that black, which is really nice. That's not quite dry. That's why it's still shiny, but it'll, it'll dry matte. But I love that shine. I love how the black, and you could saturate this. If you wanted to go for it and do it just like we did these other backgrounds, wet it, drip it, you could do all that. It's just a thinner paper. So you might get a little ripple or lasagna in there, but you could dry that flat. But if you don't saturate it, then you get to take advantage of the color. And I just work on a full sheet of backdrop just because you would cut this, right? This would become a card. I'll just take, will you hand me that uh, guillotine trimmer real quick, please? Sure. Just because by cutting that, thanks Mario, by cutting that apart, it just, again, just makes you, thanks, You're makes you mindful of what you can do. Just wanted to clear a landing spot for this little trimmer that'll fit on camera. But you're creating a card, just take your background and just chop it and chop, okay? Say, so, all right, I'm just gonna do that on a tag. There we go. Now two backgrounds. Two backgrounds that could be on a card. You can mat this with uh, black cardstock. You can do so many different, so many different things with these backgrounds. So that is really the important thing of a backdrop is that it's not this, this workable size really it's just designed to like use and cut up for something else so it could be a book cover i just i like the idea of remembering to take some some different papers and just chopping it up so here we've got this skull one let's go in with a we're going to do decayed and winter frost let's take a little bit of that a little bit of blue a little bit of decayed there we go This one, can you please rinse that in the water and just spray it? Sure. I got a little boogie in there. Yeah. I got a little clogged sprayer, so Mario's gonna, Mario's gonna help me out. I don't have my, I can change it with this one. Let me move this. There we go. Now I'm in business. Okay. Ooh, good, good. All right. Just gonna give a little bit of splattering of water, not much, and then we'll dry it. So notice on this, when I was doing these backgrounds, I kind of kept my distance. Now that really has to just do with the splatter effect. It's again, no right or wrong, but the closer you are, the more you're gonna you know, be all buckshot bill. You're just gonna have a big bullseye of color on the background and thanks Mario. And the further you are, uh, the further you are, you just get more of that splatter. And that's really what I like because I can still see the paper, but then when the light hits it, you just, you get that whole, that whole shine of mica and the staining, that color. And this could still be ink blended. You can go in with your, your oxides. You can still stamp on this again if you wanted to, but I love how the black also takes it. So here, let's do this background. This one's going to be great. Um, just gonna do a, a mist of water, just because I always do. I just I, I want my colors just to flow a little different. Let's take that. Let's take a little bit of jack-o'-lantern. There's not much left of that. Good thing it came back. 
because this was this was set one. I don't even know if I have any left. This was set one and really I'm like down to nothing. So I was very happy that it's like we're going to bring them all back. I think a lot of people are like that with flickering candle as well. Okay. There's a little bit of yellow. That was some harvest moon. Now where is it? There we go. Fallen acorn. That's going to be just that nice dark and we're going to do a little bit of ominous and a little blast of hocus pocus so this one i'm going to hold this tag up and i'm going to start spraying from the top hopefully you guys can see that on camera i just want my colors just to start taking on a linear approach not everything has to be this smashy smashy do there we go oh look that came from the the bottle the one that I took the schnozzle out of because I didn't shake because that tube just took it right out of that. Actually, I think I'm going to use that. Oh, I like that, that heavy concentration. I'm just going to dab it. Look at that. See, I like what that did. Use it up. Okay. So once we're happy with this, just move into a, a safe landing space. Now we'll dry this. So the other thing, again, about letting gravity <laughs> help you with your background, sometimes we're working we're so used to working straight up and down that we spray stuff we always print stuff we spray stuff but we don't ever think of like dragging a color down or doing it down on one side and this really allows that whole effect to take place so like on this edge okay if you want to leave that sludge you can leave that sludge if you want to pick some of that color up this time i'm using a cotton cloth instead of a paper towel because i don't want it to turn white Remember I said at the, at the beginning that when you take a paper towel, it reveals kind of that lighter white space. Well, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to get rid of that sludge border and then we're going to dry it. Beautiful. I do love that text. I love that, that addition to the, the sludge of the mica. There's so many things you guys can do really. But this black paste, I don't know. It's just something about it. It's so magic how, how it holds on to that color but yet is still visible. That's what I think is so great. Really, really good. And see, people would be afraid to put all those colors down, you know, orange, yellow, green, purple. Gosh, that is, that is a recipe for mud. But if, you, if you're mindful of where you put it and you keep in mind, okay, if I'm gonna pick this up, I wanna make sure that I'm not holding it this way because then all my purple would have ran in or this way. I'm just gonna watch and see what happens, but take a look at that. I mean, Sweet mother of mica. That's delish. Uh -huh. That is really good and great with that stencil because uh, again, the mica also wants to gather around. It's just one of the, <laughs> I, I call it a quality, but it is, it's one of the qualities of the mica stain. I love how it, it tends to pull up around that any kind of paste as it does, but it just, it gives it such a, see, it just looks gilded to me. Beautiful. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Let's take a look at, I know there was a background. Okay. Let's take a look at this one. Um, this is, this is grit paste crypt. And sometimes when people see this, they just think of it as a top coat and it is a great top coat. We talked about it, but remember what I shared at the very beginning, this is all about, if you, if you watch my, my lives and sometimes I've had to sit through them to, to listen to myself again. And I do ramble on, it's just how it is. I'm, I'm better in live than I am in voiceover because I think sometimes my my mouth moves faster than my brain. So I think that's why it's just better that I do live uh, because if I had to keep up with what was going on as a voiceover, I could never keep up. I could never keep up, but I, I do me, I try. So the thing to know about when you learn the properties of a product, it's about connecting the dots. So at the beginning, when we talked about this paste. We talked about coloring it, coloring it with a reinker. Well, if you can color it with a reinker, that means it's going to take color that means we can put color on it. So for this one, we're just gonna add some color to this tag. And I think I want this to be a little bit more concentrated. So for this one, I'm not going to spray it with water. Ooh, I'm gonna just go in. That's a little fallen egg corn. Then we're gonna use a little unravel just to kind of soften that edge. Unraveled is kind of like this fill in the blanker. There we go. Here's some, maybe do some phantom mist. That's another great color. And then let's take a little, where are we over here? I don't want that, I don't want that. Ah, there you are. 
So holly branch, although this could have been a Halloween color, holly branch is like crushed olive. So if you love crushed olive, see, that's the color of holly branch, which was, which was a Christmas uh, stain. Because bubbling cauldron, that was, and wicked elixir, that was always Halloween, just really, really good. Okay. Uh, so which stencil is that? Um, you know, I'm not really good at that. I hope somebody in the chat will. Uh, Mario, you can grab it. I, maybe I can find it quick. Let's see. Stencils are in numbers. So let's see if I can find it quick enough. Oh, there we go. It is number 161. That one. And it comes in large and mini. It's really cool. Don't know the name of it, but it's a, it's a very cool stencil. All right. I want to put a little bit more. I'm going to do a little bit more Phantom Mist over here. And then I'm going to add a little bit of Burning Ember to the top of this. Okay, this is just going to be uh, kind of like a rust. So for this one, again, I'm keeping my distance, so I'm kind of off camera. But I'm just letting some of those colors just kind of splatter down Wh wherever they go. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. You know, don't, don't try to post a note or, or block it with your hand. Just go for it. So as this is drying, then I'm just going to add a little bit of water just to get these colors to play nice with each other. Because I feel that if I don't add a little bit of water, I'll probably see more of the spray factor. Same thing as it's drying. I'm just going to kind of move that, that rust or that orange down the side. Okay. Now let's see what we get. Let's let this thing dry. Mm. Totally different background, but we, we need to see how this paste dries because right now it's wet and when it's wet it does look totally different but as it dries it I don't, I don't know how to describe it it gilds in such a way <laughs> unlike other pastes I don't know why it does what it does but I love how it does it it's just something about this crypt because of that I think it's that tint but also those little speckly fleckles of black in there so good but here you're going to see the importance of like phantom mist that that fallen acorn how we were able to add a little bit of green and then that uh, that burning ember it's a really dark rusty color like i said this is more like crackling campfire so it is that really russety color but for those that think oh well i you know i can't i can only use the grit paste crypt for you know making mossy uh nasty things nope look at that nope look at how that just so good wow 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 just it's a beautiful it's a beautiful effect and it's just a great texture it does have much more of a stone quality to it i want to try something real quick just because i'm me i'm just going to spray it with a little water i just sprayed a top coat of water i'm just going to see what happens if i take a paper towel and i just lay it over the stencil part so i'm just kind of touching it on the stencil see just to get a little bit of that just a little bit of that lifting it's just going to make it lighter you'll see what i'm I'm doing. Remember, uh, paper towels, super porous. So by using it, that's gonna, that should pull out some of that color off of the texture part. And I see by pulling it off of the texture, it's just going to stand out more from the background. That's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping to achieve. And it looks like it did exactly what I was hoping it would do. So now when you see it, can you see how you can, you identify the design more? because I just lifted some of the color. You still, you don't lose any of that shine or sheen or any of that, but I was able to lighten some of that color just to create more contrast in the background, but still just, wow, fabulous. This is so good. See, black and, and crypt. Yummy, yummy. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I'm just gonna spray. I know it's like, I wanna use this so bad, but I just can't, not in a demo. Otherwise, all I'd be doing is just mopping up the sludge and seeing what I get because I have I like to surprise myself I think it's really interesting to kind of see what you get but at this point really we've created some some unique backgrounds some just just using the mica stain just using the color just using the paste with sprays whether that's on uh, printed paper or just on tags I do love mixed media this also comes if you're not a tag person um, but I do love working on number eights and number fives this also comes in sheets it's just mixed media heavy stock it's um, it's the same type of paper that's in a Dilutions journal, but it's just heavier. It's just thicker. So if you have a Dilutions journal, you can do any of these uh, techniques in that. You can use her ink sprays in, in combination with the mica stains as well. And she has shimmer sprays. I mean, there's a lot of product out there for, for just 
mixing and matching and kind of playing. Okay, let's talk about crayons real quick. So crayons, what is Mario's? If you could only see over here, but like Mario's just standing there with his hands up, like, I don't know what you want me to do. There you go. Because I see you have a pile of stuff. I don't know what you want me to do. Uh, this one, by the way, is just a demo because I wanted to see if ink would work on glow, and it does. But you'll see that when it glows in a, in a, in a little bit. I'm not not trying to tease. Okay. Crayons. Let's just do something really quick with crayons. Uh, let's take... Um, you have me thinking candy corn, Mario. So we're going to do a little candy corn-ish. And then, ooh, that's going to be good. Oh, that's going to be good. Oh, let's do this real quick. OK. Oh. Someone made candy corn? Thank you. <laughs> I'll use a small one. I can't right? process a pumpkin too quick. That's a good idea, right? OK. One other thing that I'll talk about real quick, and you can go back to watch uh, Distress 2022. I'll be doing this more throughout the season is we can also stamp with these. Actually, I'm not. I have to show you now. You can stamp with stain. Okay, you can do some other things with stain. I'm gonna talk about that. So you derailed. It was like eating that little candy corn was like superpower. It was like, whoop, there you go, it was like a recharge. Okay, mica stains, even though they're sprayable, I think sometimes we underestimate what we can do with them, where you wouldn't think that you're gonna stamp with a spray, but you can. Leaves a beautiful thing with that. Backgrounds are also good, but you need to keep this in mind. If you're going to stamp with a stain, your image needs to be more raised area and recessed, distinct raised and recessed. This would not be good because it's not distinct enough. This is going to stamp in a hot mess if you try to use a spray. Ink, beautiful, but spray stain, not good, okay? Because we don't have a distinct difference. This stamp set, really good because we can see distinct difference but not every stamp on this set is good this one this would stamp more solid than say this one that has more open space so if you're going to try stamping with stain which i'll show you real quick definitely choose your images uh, accordingly so let's say we want this of course inspired tapestry see this is the same design as that folder so if you like it as a stamp or a folder there you go you can do both um this one, let's do this leaf. I like this, we'll take that. We'll just get these out of the way. Um, and I've got some blocks here. I have a block for that stamp. Okay, let's play around. Why not? So as I mentioned, I like to work on craft for this. So if I'm gonna use a leaf, let's take a little bit of, well, I'm gonna do some green, I don't, I don't mind. We'll do a little bubbling cauldron. Now, the nice thing about this also is you can make a palette and you can get a lot of stampings off of uh, this palette. We'll do a little Wicked Elixir. I'm gonna also use a little bit of, where is specimen? Here we go. There's our specimen. And each time I do give it a little shake, but remember these have been laying on their side, so it is pretty easy to just kinda, kinda go for it. And I'm gonna do a little mold cider over here and we'll do a little bit of Unraveled. Or not, nope. Oh, my little, see the little schnozzles folded? The little schnozzles folded one? at the bottom. Yeah, look at, one look at that. Ink. It's just got a little kink in it. Uh, can you just <laughs> trim that, put that in? Thanks. Sure. Okay, we'll use what's here. So what I'm gonna do with the stamp is I'm just gonna take that, tapity tap. Now keep this in mind. If I took this stamp and rotated it, I would be taking orange and going into green, which then makes brown. So if this is a stamp pad, you kind of want to keep it where that is does that make sense so if i'm going to do the orange keep that there okay and then you can just stamp it just stamp with purpose lift it but don't judge it don't be judging mcjudge dry it that to me is really really beautiful i think that by seeing what happens is what's going to ultimately uh, reveal the magic can you add water you can you don't need to but you can it will it will lighten the effect a little bit, but that's not a bad thing. Could you do this on watercolor paper? Yes, you could do that as well. That's not a bad thing either. But here's what I love about this effect is that you just get this beautiful color with that shimmer over the top of it. Can you see that? And the more spray you have, so let's just say we just really went to town because you could do that. So if I have a lot of stain, sometimes that could happen where you're just, your palette is loaded up because you're just so excited and you have that much stain down and you put your stamp in there. Is that going to be wrong? It isn't, but I'll just show you the difference. You're just going to have a lot of liquid there 
and that's okay. You're just gonna get more color. Probably should have done a side by side, but you get it front and back, that's all right. But beautiful, so, so simple. You don't need water, you don't need anything, and you could actually create a palette. Um, just keep in mind that if your colors were separate, meaning let's say you did red and yellow and green, if you dip your stamp in and you move it, when your stamp touches a clean spot, it's gonna pull some of that color off. So my advice if you're doing a blend is that you kinda of wanted to create uh, that whole thing uh, together. Look at that. So that one, we have way more color and mica than we do there. Is there a right or a wrong? No, it's whatever you prefer. And you could even go as far as to taking watercolor paper. Let's do this again. We're gonna go into that orange, we'll dip up into that green. We'll probably end up brown this time, but that's okay. Gonna stamp and lift. You wanna stamp and lift, you don't wanna stamp and hold. Uh, so if you, that's why I prefer a block versus a stamping tool for this. Um, because if you do a stamping tool and you press down and you allow that color to soak into your paper, you don't get as much mica movement. Meaning you don't get all that stuff sitting on the surface. I don't know why, it just soaks in too much. So, so this one's watercolor paper and I just wanted to show you why uh, I wanna do watercolor paper. Still a beautiful effect, still mica, still beautiful, still shimmery, but this one, you could just go in with a brush now, just a water brush, or it could be a paintbrush with water. I happen to like a water brush because it controls the amount of water. Uh, this is a detailer, so it just keeps its shape. And I just start by just, you could swipe it on your craft mat or your hand. You just wanna see water, that's it. You don't wanna squeeze it once you start using it because the bristles are designed to dispense just a slight uh, amount of water. But this one I can just go in and now just pull, just gently pull that color from the sides. Super, super simple. Then I can just clean it. I don't like to clean it on a paper towel because I don't want a dry brush, I want a water brush. Um, you can embrace the space. Because I'm going from orange into green, I just wiped off the brush. This, this way I can pull in that specimen and kind of cauldron. You can embrace the space if you want. There we have it. Beautiful. So now we still get the mica and now we have a little watercolor. Easy. Super, super simple. And you could watercolor on any surface. You could do this on craft. Craft is not as forgiving. You'll see in a second. Um, it's not designed to, to be forgiving. Craft is a porous paper. That's why if you want a watercolor, watercolor paper. But it doesn't mean you can't blend. It's still going to pull some of that color. It's going to pull more of the dye than anything. Let's just dry this just so you can see the full effect but just to show different ways that we can use the mica stains. It doesn't always have to be this spray splatter crime scene that people seem to associate sprays with. I used to, I can't, I'm not Judge McJudge. I used to be like, I'm not interested in sprays. They're a mess, but they're really not. It just, it's how you want to use them. But see this one, I, I kind of feel like I lost my detail a little bit. This one, I think it kept the detail, but here's another thing. If you are using a stamping tool with this, you could go in and double stamp. I just double stamp by winging it. I didn't use a stamping tool. I did pretty good though. Um, but you could stamp on top of this with black. You could use archival, that's totally fine. So maybe we wanna do a background. So to clean my stamp, it's just gonna clean off with water. That's it. Water, wipe it off, and we're, we're good, okay? Let me, oh man, that is just a background. <laughs> okay. So speaking of background, let's take a background stamp. We're gonna do the same thing. Spray, spray. Spray, spray. So this is just a couple colors of, of purple. I'm not gonna just do the whole thing because you kind of you guys have already seen it, but just to give you the idea, we'll take this one. So could you use a block? Yes, absolutely. But this one I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna play. And because it's all purples, I can splash around. I can get a little, a little mix and match, just get it on there. But this one's fun because I can just go in and kind of roll it in just different areas and just create more of a random pattern. Could you have put it on a block and stamped it? Absolutely you can, but I've already shown you that with the leaf. This is just another way to incorporate a stamp, all right? Yes, you could also use embossing powder with these because embossing powder, remember from the glaze, anything that's wet, you can put powder on. So while that stain is wet, you could certainly put powder on there. Okay, that's beautiful. Nice. 
Okay, so this one I'm drying. I wanna make sure this is dry. So there's our stamp background. We can see that mica. Let's just play around with something else. Let's just take this and just go in two and one. And now I'm just gonna spray this with water, get that color to just start moving and migrating. I just wanna see. Don't judge, you never know. It could be a hot mess. It's appearing to be a hot mess, but. Yeah, it's a hot mess. It's still gonna be a beautiful background I'll stamp again. But here's the thing. If you stamp in a, like a distress ink, you could spray it with water and it would maintain. Oh, it's there's a little bit there. Yeah, I spoke too soon. Let's get in there. Listen to me, doubting the process. What's up with you, Holtz? Okay. It's better with distress ink, but this is still working. I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a in just a second. If you emboss over the mica, it the shimmer does not come through. No, the mica has to be the top layer for it to for it to shine. Yeah, I still I'm not happy with the results, but it's it's not a total failure. I'll show you what I was doing. So when you stamp in dry paper, your image appears. But in this case, I felt I lost the damask because all I have is really little little dots of everything. So, but if you were stamping more of a detailed image with ink, you could spray it with water and the image stays, but the color bleeds. This one, I would consider this a fail, but I'm still just gonna use this background uh, for something else. So it's not total, but let's just do another one though. But now I know. Do I wait until I'm off camera to answer my own ideas? No, because it's just paper. There we go. There's another background, very cool but I do love this one. Woo -wee. All right. Do a little drippy. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. I'm going to show you one other thing and then we will get onto crayons because it kind of, uh, when I was creating some backgrounds for this, it just kind of sparked a little what if, because there is something really magical about, mm, see, I'm loving this background now. There is something super magical about the mica and how it just seems to have a mind of its own. And the mica in the stain reacts very different than the mica in the crayon. Okay. So let's, yes, thanks. Okay, so those are our two backgrounds. We're gonna set them aside. I'll pile them up over here as well. Let's spray this with water just to get rid of that purple haze. Okay. So when it comes to crayons, let's take a little, we're gonna do a little blueprint. I chose a very small image to color just because you'll know why I don't want to spend a lot of time coloring, but it's still fun to color. And I will take, uh, I don't need something that big. I'll take uh, a little, I know. And I had a lot of room when we started, didn't I? This is, this is whole, the whole idea. Okay. There we are. So we're gonna do this on craft and watercolor. So I just chose a small stamp and very basic. This is a candy corn blueprint. I do love the blueprint series. Mario's son drew all the blueprints through all the years. We had so many years of blueprints. There's so many cool ones. Um, they're like coloring books for adults. They come big and they come mini. That's another one I love. That's a great blueprint series. Yeah, but these are mini. See that comes big and small. Anyway, all right, do candy corn. I'm stamping in archival. So I want to stamp something, uh, stamp it in ink that's going to be waterproof. So I'll stamp it. I agree. They are. They're just so much fun. They're a favorite. I just love it. Gosh, just this, it's like so long ago. Okay. Stamping. Uh, another thing that I do, like when I have a small stamp, I like to put it on a long block. Uh, well, one, just because I have, I just have chunky fingers. And I find that like, if I'm trying to stamp it on a card, I can't see where I'm stamping. And this is if you don't have a stamping tool or you don't want to bother with one because maybe you're making quick little tags. But if you have a longer block, put a smaller stamp on there. This way you can position it where you want and then you can stamp, position it and stamp. So that's just why I chose this size block even though I had that smaller block for the leaf, okay? So I've stamped in archival, that made it permanent, waterproof. And we'll go in with the crayons. Now let me just grab, we'll do that. We'll do that, but I'm also gonna take, uh, uh oh, what is that? Oh, that's a sprayer. Ah, thanks. We'll take some other colors and I think I'll even do, where is it? I'll use this one. I don't necessarily have a white crayon yet. 
Okay. Yet, yet. Because, you know, you need that little, that <laughs> little bit of white in the corn. Okay. Um, so the great thing about this is we can just go in and, and add some color. So you could color direct, but keep in mind, this is a, this is a pigment, but unlike the regular crayons, these have that mica in them, that little bit of shimmer. Now you could blend it with another crayon. So we can go in and blend, or we can blend with a water brush, but I do like the fact that you can blend crayon with crayon. You never have to, you don't always have to use a brush. You can, but you don't always have to. So here I'll take a little bit of that orange. There we go. That's a little jack-o'-lantern. That's a little mold cider. Okay. And then this one, I think I will blend just because I talked about it. <laughs> if I could find the water brush. I found the cap. There we go. Just so you can see that it is very easy. It's a water reactive pigment. It's very easy to manipulate the crayons. So you can easily blend them or not. And even on craft, you'll be able to move it because it's a pigment. So unlike a dye, this is sitting on the surface. That's what's really great about uh, crayons. And then we would just go in, that one's already white, but this one you would go in with a white pearly crayon, but we'll just save that for another time. Let's dry these for a second. Okay. <laughs> I've been waiting so long too. Uh, really good. Okay. So do you have to use a heat tool to dry these? No, you do not. I'm just, I want to show you the, the really the effect of the mica in the crayon. So that's why I'm using uh, a heat tool, but you don't have to heat dry them, but there you go. So that's, what's really great about this is that you get that shine. Could you double stamp it? Could you stamp on top of it to create an outline like I've done with paint? Yes, you can. Um, but you can see that what's nice about the mica crayon is that it just still gives you that shine and that color. They're quite fun. They're really quite fun to do. And I use crayons for a lot of things, but I'm going to get more into the crayons um, probably just in future demos because I've done them many, many times and I love working with them. But here's the thing to note about sprays. Let's say we took a, what do we want to take? I'll, I'll use mold cider. That would be, a, that's a good one. All right. I'm just going to shake this up. Just want to make sure it's mixed up. And I'm just going to spray some on the mat. Let's say you had a stencil that you really liked. Now I would probably pick something that's a little, I don't know, a little bit on the, just the bigger side, meaning I probably wouldn't do, you could, you could do the bats, but you're going to need something a little smaller. I, like I wouldn't do the text for what I'm going to share with you. Just a pattern that you want. I'm looking for something maybe kind of, I don't know, polka dotty. That'll work. That's going to be good. There we are. Okay. So let's do this one. That's going to work. It doesn't really matter, but you're, you're going to get where I'm going in just a second. I thought to myself, what if I really wanted to incorporate a stencil with a spray without necessarily spraying it? Could I blend with it? Well, the answer is yes. So um, I prefer to work with uh, a domed foam. So I have, I have a little trash bucket that I have like a, <laughs> a demo tool and all the little attachments. Maybe it's foam, maybe it's felt, because these are washable and reusable. So I'm just going to use a piece of dome foam and I'm going to pick up the stain, but I'm going to like work it into the foam. So I'm not going to dab it and then go for it. I'm just going to kind of work that into uh, the foam a little bit. So it's not saturated. See the foam is designed where that ink can kind of sit on the surface. And then I'll just go in and just, just blend like you would blend. Blend like the wind. No, I don't, I don't even remember what live I said that for. Okay. But I'm just going to pick up that color and just, just blend. Do you remember Mario? So this again is just using a spray, just moving some of that color. So I'm not dabbing and dabbing off. I'm just, I'm always kind of doing that little, that little blending vibe. And I'll show you, I'm just, I'm going to blend out the edges. Cause I don't want you to think I'm like cheating. Okay. <laughs> And I'll go in the corner and I'll do like a couple of layers. All right. So check out the ability of blending with mica. So you actually get the color, you get the shine and you get the fade. You get the fabulous, pretty cool. So is it as intense as when you spray it? No, because obviously we're spraying out more 
color more mica, but do you still get that shift? Yes. And could you do it on, you know, even, even darker papers? Let's say we're going to do this on, on black. Maybe we want to take this same thing. Let me, what you need? I was looking for this candy corn. Oh, the mini? Yeah. Yep. So that's a mini. So it does come in a, it does come in a bigger one and that one's mixed. And the blueprints also come in strips. So you can just buy that strip of Halloween. I believe Stampers Anonymous still, still does that. So the blueprints, if you're doing the CMS set, they come in like three, but you can also just get uh, just a just the one set. Okay. So what you're going to notice on black, so this is distressed black heavy stock is we should see just more of the mica, not as much of obviously the color blend, but it's still going to show up. And this black is going to be a porous paper. You always want to use something porous. Okay. But we're still going to get that pattern, but that shine. See that? So it's almost like a metallic paste that's not a paste. It's just, you're just using your inks to blend. And even something so detailed still blends because we were blending. That's the whole thing about creating with it. It's just, it's really important just to, to be aware that when you're working with sprays, you can blend them, you can stamp with them, you can do backgrounds with them. It's crazy how many things you can do with them. All right, I'm just gonna throw that in water. That's gonna rinse that off. Okay, so now I've talked about color, I've talked about stamp, I've talked about blend, I've talked about grits. Now it's time to talk about glow. Okay, so the whole thing about this paste, as I mentioned, is that it is a little bit more fluid. It's designed to be spreadable. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, it still has a viscosity, has a consistency to it, but I wanted the ability to not only go through a stencil, so even something like a star, but I also wanted the ability to spread it out thin if I wanted to use it on papers um, or create texture with it. So when you, when you go and apply it, if you're applying it, you can apply it direct with a palette knife. So see, you can, you can build up the texture, like I would say like buttercream, okay? But if you wanted to spread it out thinner, you're going to want to get either a thinner palette knife or we talked about getting um, like some type of, of squeegee. Now, because this is a texture, a grit, I found that this one uh, created a little bit of a skip. So I didn't necessarily, uh, even though this is rubber, I wasn't that successful with it, but this palette knife, and this comes in the distress set, you get two of them. But if you have a longer one, this is going to allow me just to kind of spread it really thin. And you'll see because it's gritty that it could catch a grit, see like that little rock and kind of drag through it. But don't let that discourage you. You can just keep going and spreading this out and you can get it as smooth or as textured as you want. But this one is just allowing me to really thin it out. Do you, you see the difference? So you can apply it thick or thin. For the moon, I wanted it thin. Now, could you use it with the stencil? <laughs> you could, but here's the thing to understand about that. The moon, let me find it here. The moon stencil is a stencil, meaning you place it down, okay? And you're not getting anything to show because it's a stencil, so you're blocking it off. So if you, you can't use it with the glow because how do you get the glow on the moon? Because you're really masking the moon. And then you might think, okay, well then I'll put this over the top. Well, yeah, you could, but then all you're, all you're really glowing is this part because again, the circle is masked off. So a stencil is more for inking and creating these backgrounds. These moons are actually created using a die cut, the new, moonlit die. So this, these is actually a die cut because I just shared on the stencil, the stencil, you're actually blocking it off to create that. So all of these are done with a stencil starting on, on light paper. So this color of the moon is actually the color of the paper. It was just protected by that. So that's why I wanted to share it in this demo, because I felt when you saw a glowing moon, you would assume it's done with the moon masks, but they're not because these are masks. They're designed to mask off an area. Instead, we're going to talk about the die cut and give you tips on how to do it. Because uh, there was a couple of ways that I did it that I felt one was way easier than the other. Okay. So real quick, let me just cap up this paste just to kind of show you what we can do. 
So this is a cool die. This is a, a new die that I did for this season. Uh, and it's got the, the great moons. It's called, it's, it's moonlight and it's got two different size moons and some bats. Now the moon was certainly inspired by the mask, without a doubt. I used the same kind of design on the inside, but these masks were perfect circles because it was a, a mask. But for a die, I wanted it to be a little bit more wonky, have a little characteristic. So you can see that this, it's a wonky shape because I wanted that when you're doing a die, like I didn't want it to be a oop, wet paste, caution. I wanted it to be a little bit just, let me set this off to the side. I wanted this just to be a little bit more fun. So this die, you actually get the circles, the outlines, you get all these different bats and you also get these, okay? Because these are designed to build together. So let me just take you through my creative process, okay? So you could do the moon this way where we are using both die pieces, okay? That would be the solid, which is the background, and the detail, which is the top piece. So there's actually two moons sandwiched together. But you can also create the moon just using, you still need to use both dies, but in a different way. So let me show you. And let me show you why my brain thinks the way it thinks. And of course, I mean, really how freaking amazing are these bats? Oh my gosh, all these bats on the front. They're so good. And the way the die is designed, they all, like you get big bats by themselves, but then you also just get these little trios of shapes so you can create that forced perspective. So inspired by uh, Disney Halloween. I love just all the bats. Okay, here we go. Stay with me. I'll try to explain it the best I can. If you have questions, please uh, ask as we go and I'll try to make sure I don't skip it over because it, it probably I spent a few hours yesterday on this just because I knew the way I was going to do it, but then I was like, I would probably not do this often, so I need to find a trick. Okay, the thing to know about these dies, that this paste is die cuttable, but not with anything detailed, okay? That's the important thing to note. So when I tried to die cut this piece through a piece of paper that had already was pasted and dry, I could not get it to cut out. I did many layers. I used a chrome precision base plate. I tried to shim and I could not get it to cut, which means it's not meant to cut. It's uh, that die is not meant to cut this material because this paste obviously has something in it that allows it to remain flexible. And I kind of feel that when the die was trying to go through it, it was like going through something squishy and the die couldn't make a clean cut all the way through the paper. This one, because it was less detail was no problem. So I'll show you that way, which is just two layers, but I also want to talk about how we can layer it. Okay. So the first way is if you want to just go this route, if you want to go the, the challenging route, here's how I approached it. Because it couldn't already be pre-pasted, I went in and I cut out my pieces out of the cardstock I wanted. In this case, it was watercolor cardstock. So let me just clear the deck so I don't confuse anyone any more than I probably already have because I've confused myself already. This is a double layered one. So if you're going to do it with the die cut pieces, two of them, here's how I started. I first cut out my pieces out of cardstock. So this would be my solid and this would be uh, the top layer. Now, my top layer, after I cut it, I wanted to keep all the pieces in the best I can. Uh, it's very easy if they fall out of the die, you can pop it back in, no problem. But what we need to do is I found it easier to paste it with those pieces in because if I, if I removed all of these pieces, it would look something like this. And then if I tried to put paste on it, this would really act as a stencil, right? So all the paste would start building up in here. And then when I lift it up, it would just become really wet and mucky. That's, that's what I found. So what I decided to do was just get a piece of sticky grid. Now sticky grid is something that Sizzix sells. You can cut it up. And to me, it's just, I used it for this and I throw it away because it's just sticky grid. So I only cut a piece big enough for what I need. I didn't, I didn't want to be wasteful. All right. This has two sides. So it's sticky when you peel it. And then when you peel off the release paper, it's sticky again. So I just stuck it down onto the mat. I took my die cut piece with the pieces in it and I stuck it down onto the sticky and anything that comes out like that little piece, just put it back in. 
if you can, the best you can. It's, it's not the end of the world. And like I said, you could do it with all these pieces out. It would just act as a stencil and it's going to grab a lot of that medium. Come on, pork chop. There we go. All right. So all my pieces are stuck down. Can you guys see that? There we go. And then we have this piece over here and then we have our grip paste glow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of this paste. This is why having it spreadable was really, really important because I can spread it on. I can take the palette knife and I can just move this around and just get it as, as thin as I want, as textured as I want, completely up to you. Um, is this one of those things that like the more paste you have, the brighter it glows? Yes, that is true. Um, the thicker it is, meaning if you don't see much of your paper, then it will glow brighter, but you can always scrape off the stuff that comes off of the edge. And the reason I'm using the sticky grid is it's just allowing me to do this without chasing or holding on to the die. Does that make sense? I hope it does. You'll see. Okay. So I kind of feel like I'm good with this. Just want to make sure I'm going to do one little like skimming layer just because I don't need a ton. I can put all that back and then just go in with a craft pick and we're going to pick this off of the grid. Now, some of the stuff might stick and if it does, then you're in luck because I consider that a bonus. Some, not everything will, but that's okay. If it does, it does. And if it doesn't, it, it doesn't, but whatever we can get to stay out cool and whatever lifts off, that's all right. So, what we need to do is you actually have to remove these pieces now, which seems like, how do I do this? You just kind of do it. You just look at the back and you're just going to push these pieces out while this is wet, because if it dries, it's going to stay connected. And believe it or not, this paste is pretty, pretty forgiving. So even like little fingerprints, it wasn't the end of the world because it was still textured. So I flipped it over and I'm like, oh, there's a piece there and pop it out. Okay. So I did that to this piece. I did all the little, the little bits, you could scrape the paste off of this or you could save it for something else, I suppose, if you want. And then you're going to let this dry. Okay. That was step one. For the back of this one, you're just going to spread the paste on. You can put it back down. You can leave it on the mat. You can use a corner of it and you're going to let it dry and you're done. And you'll, you'll end up with two pasted pieces that are already die cut. Does that make sense? Okay. Then once it's done, you would just sandwich them together. I just use some little foam squares in between to create that effect. That's great. You could see it wasn't that hard. It's a little bit messy, but it, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, that's so hard. I, I can't really do it. It's, it's really, to me, it's a, it's a simple thing. I saw a message. Can you cut from the other side where there is no paste? You could cut through the paper, but then it wouldn't cut through the paste. So it, it still leaves a great imprint, which led me to this because when I tried to cut it and it didn't cut, I'm like, okay, there's something there. So here is what, here's what I, what I did this. I'm just going to peel off, throw that away, get rid of this. Okay. So like I said, could you do this die cut one? Absolutely. It's not a problem. Easy enough. But if you want to create some quick ones, there's an easier way to do it. In my opinion, let me move these wet pieces out because I'm just going to stick something like my hand in it. Okay. So what I did is I took a piece of cardstock and I spread it the grit paste glow on there. And I spread it to where I got some cool texture. You see that? I wanted to have some really um, unique texture. That's what, that was important to me. Then what I wanted to do is, yeah, the black foam scores are very cool. Simon Says has them, they have them in thin, which is what I use. All right, so first I wanna just cut out the shape out of this. So I'm gonna take that thin die and we're gonna cut it. Let me get my machine, got that. Because I'm die cutting, I need to get more pieces. I got to put in my thin die adapter. There we are. I've got my top plate, my bottom plate. So I'm just going to place that down right over the paste. And I'm going to run this through. Easy enough. It's easy to run a die through. Not like a folder, but thanks Mario. Mario was at the ready. He's like, I gotcha. Okay. So this, you could see even on that circle, it didn't want to make a cut in the first pass. So I'm going to do it again. Place that die back down. Make sure it, hopefully it stays lined up. We'll do it another pass. See, even a circle, it's just, I think it's just something to do with uh, the flexibility of the pace, but that's okay. I'm okay with it. All right. There we go. Two passes, 
we're good to go. So now we have this wonderful moon glow texture disc. <laughs> okay, you could use this for something else, I'm sure. But see, I kind of, I mean, I managed how much paste I'm gonna need. I didn't really wanna waste the paste. Okay, so far so good. We're gonna just set this because we're gonna come back to it in just a second. Okay, so now I have this shape, but what do I do about this? How do I get the design in here? Well, it's pretty easy because you can match up the wonk because this does have a wonky shape. So you just kind of like you're, it's almost like you're just trying to be a safe cracker, I guess, if, if you were a safe cracker. You just spin it around to where it lines up and you can line it up to the nearest ish, but you will see that it's lined up versus not lined up. Okay. And it kind of fits into its space. And I got to, I mean, I'll talk more when we do the physics slide, but I got to do a shout out to Lisa Jones who really helped with this release and, and all these details that I was like, it needs to do this. We need to do this. She's like, okay. All right. So once it's lined up, we're going to run it through again. So we've already cut the circle. Now we put the circle into the die shape because that also has a blade. Place it down. Now, could you tape it? Yes. If you, like I just became a little misaligned. It's okay if it, if it gets a little, a little wonky, not a problem. Put my top cutting pad. There we go. So same thing. I'm just going to give it a roll. Okay. So see, it didn't cut anything. It didn't even give you, it didn't even attempt it. It was like, yeah, good luck with that. We've already had this conversation asked and answered, but I ran it through and here's why. Once this is run through, thank you. Traditionally, when we do dies, a die has a flat area with poke holes. That's the place that you would go with your die pick and you would poke it out. But they don't always have to be a hole. For the most part, it's just an easy way to design a die. But sometimes we can design a die and actually make the poke holes because this really, this area, a poke hole could actually be a shape. And that's what we wanted to do, whether it's a poke hole or another blade, I wanted this to match the shape of the moon. And the reason is, is that we can go in and we can color this. Now, this is another thing that practice makes perfect, okay? I tried archival. Now, archival ink and grit paste glow did not do well together. It was something in the formulation. So when I tried to ink it with archival, this stayed sticky indefinitely. It's still sticky today. I tried distress ink, it wiped off. I tried oxide ink, it wiped off. But I wanted to add color, the same way I added color to this, that would dry, but still allow me to blend. Hello, distress crayons. So you could use whatever color you want, but I used hickory smoke, and I just took the distress crayon scribbled out some hickory smoke on the mat, took a blending brush, because you want a brush, a foam is not gonna transfer enough, and you wanna add a little bit of water because this is a water reactive pigment. Remember when we did these, that water makes this color move? So I don't wanna get this wet, I just wanna get my brush a little bit wet to where this color starts to move, but I want it to move in kind of a thick way. So I'm loading up my brush, and what I love about the blending brush is that I can now slide it forward to make the bristles more compact. And now I'm just gonna go right into this open area of my die and add my shading with the crayon. So I can pick up more color. If, if it's not re-wetting, just add a little water. So I'm sliding it back to pick it up because I want it in the bristles and then sliding it forward with my finger just to get in those areas. And the die is kind of locked in there. So it allows you just to really create, you know, you'll see that it's like, I'm kind of going light into dark. Okay, that's totally going to work. All right. And then this, this little outer area, it's pretty much going to cut. You can go in with your scissor and trim this off, but you can see it pretty much just cut it away. I'm just going to drag that with my finger just to take that off. Okay. So once you've added your shading, now you just pop it out. And when you pop it out, not only did it, it deboss those lines, so that gave you dimension, but now you have all your color and it's done. Now your moon's done. So that's how I did these two. Uh, the same on that tag, it's just one piece. It's done twice. Now, is it different? Sure, it's different. Would you say that, you know, this has more depth? Of course it is. This is a double die cut. That's what die cuts are all about. Could it be done? Of course, that's why I wanted to show you. It could be done. It's just a bit more finicky, but it's, I still think it's worth it. You know, if I'm gonna do a vignette box, this is the kind of moon I want uh, in the back. Um, for this shading, 
because everything else is covered, it really didn't matter. I just kind of eyeballed it and like, okay, it goes, that's how it goes. I didn't stack them to do my coloring, but I think that's a pretty good workaround uh, to create a, a moon. And you could place it back down. If you wanted to add more color, you could place it back down and you could do more crayon. But I still thought this was a great effective way to do grit paste, create a moon without doing all the die cutting because you could still die cut with paper. And if you honestly didn't care that this part was glowing, you could just do a glow circle. And then this maybe is a different kind of cardstock. But I really love the fact that the whole moon glows. And what's interesting about the crayon is that when it is dark, we won't attempt that again, but when it is dark, the moon will glow in different shades. And maybe you did see it when I was holding up the moon that it was like darker in spots because the crayon does kind of dim the glow a little bit, which is interesting. So just totally a different way uh, than the mask. And I felt that if you know you just saw this, you would assume, oh, it's the mask. And then you'd be like, wait, I don't understand. How, how did that happen? But you could, you know, for that matter, if you didn't have a die and let's say you wanted to do this, you could take your mask, you could take your circle mask for the moon, whatever size, because it came in, it came in many sizes. It, the moon mask came in three sizes, and then there was like a bonus size in the stamp timber release that we did that, that year. That's why I have four, but it comes in three. You could take this and outline it on a piece of paper, cut it out by hand, grit paste, so that's solid. And then you could just place this on top of that paste it and you could do the crayon just like we did here. So you could mimic this with these. You're just going to have to do all the cutting by hand, but that would be okay. So that's another option, but you, I mean, you won't get that little detailed pressure, but that's okay. There's always a workaround. So I just wanted to kind of give you inspiration, especially for the glow, because there's many ways that you can, you can achieve that. And really, I mean, that was such a cheat. It was a tag that already had this. I literally just stuck that moon over that moon, but I do love it. And I stack those bats over that bat because that's a stamp, but quite fun, a fun way to use a uh, grit paste glow, but it does take color and it will glow. It's just that it doesn't glow as bright as it does when it's just left alone and by itself. So huh, a lot of ideas, a lot of options and so many things. I mean, I can't wait to, to be cutting up. I've got, you know, my favorite dies and folders and stuff that I can't wait to start cutting up and utilizing uh, all of the backgrounds because when you think about it, there's really a, a lot of stuff that can be done, uh, whether we're using crayons or whether we're doing stains. Maybe you remember we blended with stains. Um, we stamped and watercolored. We just did full backgrounds. Look at that one. That's still just fabulous. That's crypt paste. That's black texture paste. That's texture paste over papers. And there's really a lot of things that could be done with this Halloween launch. And I'm super happy. I really am. It's a beautiful, beautiful release, the Distress Halloween.